Well, welcome everybody You're watching this from around the world. We're in the final day of the Bacardi Cup here in Biscayne Bay in Miami. We have one race left and I'm with Monsieur Xavier Rohart. Xavier and Pierre Alexi are two points adrift of the top of the leaderboard runners and riders, Mark Mendelblatt with Magnus Liljal. Two points in it, Xavier, it's all to play for. Yeah, for sure. Uh... We will play the game uh, outside and uh, we'll see how it's going on because uh, Mark is always really strong, really consistent, starting well. So we will need to be in front of him for sure. Uh, but we have to be also a little bit uh, conservative uh, with the other guys behind Lars, George. And uh, it will be decided after the start, I think, when we will know where everyone is. and. Uh, also regarding the wind, because it's not so strong at the moment and uh, it will be unstable. So all the nice uh, conjunction to, to have some stress and some uh, excitement. What is your game plan today? You know, are, are you going to be match racing Mendelblatt? No, we can't do match racing for sure. Uh, there is too much people to match race. Uh, so it's going to be decided turn after turn, time after time. Uh, swap to uh, we want to race to win the race that's the main goal second goal to be in front of uh, mark and the third goal if everyone is behind then we can try to be a little bit much race but it will not happen the guys are too strong too consistent so it will be more we see how it's going and can you give us an indication you've probably discussed already with Pierre Alexi any strategy off the start ah not yet we'll we do that on the water uh, we want quite safe place to start because it's very difficult uh, to start in the back alley week. Uh, there is a lots of uh, pressure, lots of uh, lots of numbers of boats, and uh, not to, the place for everyone on the starting line. So it's always uh, difficult to start. And as soon as we re reach the clean air and uh, going, then we talk about the strategy. Good luck. Merci. Mark, we've just spoken to Xavier and they are going to play their own game. I suspect that's what your game plan is too. Oh, that's good to know that. Thanks for letting me know, Digby. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it's not just me and him today. It's, there's, there's a few others in the mix. Um, so if the two of us are, are entangled and we move back in the fleet, it's open for someone else. So. I think that's the obvious game plan, you know, that everything changes and gets reevaluated after the start and, uh, you know, things, things uh, keep changing all the, all the time and we'll, we'll be looking to see where everyone is out there. But, you know, in my mind, if I'm not top three in the race today, I don't even have a chance to win. So uh, that's, that's what we're going for, a, a, a good race, try to win the race uh, any way possible, get a good start and take it from there. Um, if you don't have a good start, what happens then? Pray. I mean, look, you know, light air, uh, if, you, if you don't get a good start, you're in a lot of trouble. I mean, Xavier somehow managed to get out of jail yesterday because, I mean, we saw him at five seconds. We were rolling over the top of him at the pin, and we didn't even have a great start. So, uh, uh, you know, he, he managed to do it. If we get a bad start, we'll keep the faith and do our best, but uh, it's hard to get into a lane after a bad start in this fleet. Well, it's quite exciting because it, it really is all coming down to this race. And it is, as you say, not just yourselves, Magnus and uh, Xavier and Pierre Lexi. There is George Zabo in the mix as well with it, Eduardo. Yeah, I mean, George, you know, Lars, uh, Charlie, all the, all the guys who are, who are proven light air specialists, you know. And, and uh, here we are having to uh, try and make it happen in the last race, which is no different than the Star Sailors League uh, regatta format, which uh, has proven to be very exciting and... and uh, good for me so you know I'm hoping I can once again uh, pull a rabbit out we'll see well Magnus is champing at the bit behind you uh, where you go and okay. very very good luck to you okay thank you very much well there were the two top teams going into this final day and it, how exciting is this it's all boiling down to one race race number six I'm in the studio with none other than Kathleen Tock former US sailing team member and six times national snipe champ. And uh, we've been talking team. over the last five days and now it's getting really crunchy. It's kind of anything between about four or five teams here. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've seen uh, Mark Mandelblad and Xavier Rohart going against one another 
all week long. They always seem to be right next to one another. We've seen some match racing between the two of them. But we can't count out the likes of Lars Grell, Augie Diaz. He slipped a little bit down yesterday with a black flag start. Um, unfortunate for that team. Really gunning for this regatta because Augie's never won it before. But George Zabo has also no won, it, won it before. And it's light conditions. We know George shines in those conditions. And as Mark said, um, often when two teams are going after one another, they lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, so it really is anyone's game. And because this is such a high-level fleet, you can't afford to make mistakes, especially on the starting line today. So also that might be where we see some action at the starting line. Will Xavier engage Mark Mandelblatt? We will find out in just a few minutes. The boats are all heading out. They're schmilling around the start line. I don't think we're going to start bang on 11 o'clock. So let's have a little look at the highlights from yesterday. After a short postponement ashore, the Star Sailors were off for race five of the Bacardi Cup. Two, one, march. Bang, and off they go for the start of race number five of the Bacardi Club. Diaz and Prado, they are out. Oh, that's a magic shot. We're looking down the barrel of these guys as they head up to the top mark. The left pack looked good early, with Doyle and Felice leading at the first top mark. But it was tight behind, with a 70-strong feet battling on Biscayne Bay. Fighting for places and position, and that is a pure drag race. McCausland and Cheer had a great second lap, but ultimately attacking duel on the final beat let Buckingham and Sperry out left and into the lead. I think we are just seeing Buckingham and Sperry take the lead. Cross the line they go. Congratulations to Charlie Buckingham and Austin Sperry. Boats really set up well for the conditions. We felt pretty confident in our speed all week upwind. We had really good height today. Just We got off the line clean and we're able to have clean lanes the whole time and just keep the boat moving. So that's pretty much it. What a wonderful race, number five, of the Bacardi Cup. Points are now really tight for who will take the Bacardi Cup. Well, good scenes, good drama, good action from yesterday's racing. I should remind you, if you're watching uh, wherever you are around the world, you can chip in. Uh, we have Will, who is looking at the chat comment below your little screens on YouTube and live stream. You can uh, ask some questions, and then Will from the SSL will hand them over, and we'll do our best to answer them, get involved, get engaged, and uh, we know that uh, you're interested in this final race. Now, let's take a little virtual fly out to the race course and get a bit of geography. That's where we're commentating from, the US Sailing Center there, next door to Coral Reef Yacht Club. And we get uh, the wide view of Biscayne Bay off Miami down here in the southern USA in Miami there. We're looking at a start line, the track as you can see the boats weaving their way towards that start line. Long way from the club to the course with not a whole lot of breeze. So now, Kathleen, let's have a look at the overall leaderboard going into the final day. And this is where it gets interesting. 
Right at the top, Mark Mendelblatt, Magnus Liljdahl, 13 points. They are two points clear of Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau. Xavier, Pierre Alexis telling us this morning they will play their own game, just as Mark told us, but we will see. I'm going to put some money on these two engaging uh, around this racetrack in race six because they've almost done it every single race so far. In third spot, the danger man, George Zabo with Eduardo Natucci, the American-Italian duo. They are just five points from the lead. And if the top two engage each other, as you say, Kathleen, George could just sail round and have his day and be top of the podium and get his hands on that beautiful Bacardi trophy for the first time. Lars Grail, Sam Conchalves, two times winner of this event. They've been here before, they've done it. They are 20 points, they are seven points clear. They are well within sight of winning their third ever Bacardi Cup. This is the 90th edition of this classic trophy and uh, we're into the final race coming up in just a few minutes. Augie Diaz, Bruno Prada, have a look along their scoreline. BFD, black flagged. They were just over the line yesterday, furious about it. Three boats were black flagged by Carl Schellbach, the race officer and team out there. And that pretty much ruined their day and it took them from third on the leaderboard to fifth. So they have a bit of work to do, but don't count those guys out. They are the reigning world champions in the star. They've been training hard. They're a class act. They're great in these conditions. Augie is from here. He races here and he is a danger man. Here's Charlie Buckingham and Austin Sperry in sixth spot. They won the race yesterday. They did an amazing job and that was uh, good for them. They got black flagged in race number four, but there they are on 25 points. And then we've got McCaws Land and Cheer, the Americans in seventh. Ivan Mellaby, Josh Revkin, the Norwegian-American duo. Doyle, Infeliz in ninth. Lawrence and Coleman, the youngsters in 10th. Vesela and Trenta, who had a great first day, black flagged on the second day. But uh, talking to these guys this morning, they're really enjoying this championship. And then the good doctor, Hubert Merkelback, Sergio Lambertengi in 12th, Anasov and Caesar in 13th. But really, Kathleen, I think we're looking at the top six. Yeah, if you look at that scoreboard, there hasn't been one person who's won more than one race. So knowing that going in today, it could be any of the people in the top 10 that win this race, or even top 15 for that matter, because there's so many good sailors out here, here from so many classes, world champions, Olympians. Um, so, so you never know. It is very hard in a large fleet like this. We've talked about how long the windward legs are. They're usually 1.5 to 2 nautical miles long, and the boats can build a lot of leverage, get very far away from one another on this race course. So it's, sometimes it's very hard to control or even see those boats that you're competing against. Now, with Rohart and Mendelblatt, um, looking at those scores, a 10 and a 15 are the worst races that they have. I, we've got uh, Mark, he's got a 15th in the second race of the series, as well as Xavier, who had a 10th. Now, Xavier could actually, if he wanted to, sail Mendelblatt off the race course, and that would force Mark to keep uh, the 15 and Xavier would have a 10, so Xavier would win. We have seen that in a large fleet like this, over 70 boats, that's difficult to do. Augie Diaz tried to do that to Diego Negri and Sergio Lambertangi in the World Championships just a year ago here in Miami, and he tried to take him to the wrong side of the race course, the right side, which has been not favorite side, and then there was a huge right shift, and all of a sudden they were 1-2 again. So it's very hard to do that in a big fleet on a long course. Um, as we mentioned, Zord George Zabo from San Diego, sailing with a great crew, Eduardo Notucci from Italy. They've spent time in the boat together. They've shown their speed, and they have been fairly consistent. Um, but there we go, Grail and Consalves. Very consistent, but in order for Grail to get on that podium, he's probably going to have to have another top five finish, top three if he really wants to get up there. Diaz and Prada, they're looking to be on the podium, but they've got Charlie Buckingham and Austin Sperry right behind them, only two points behind them, but they're both carrying black flies, as well as McCausland and Shear. So those three boats have to be a little bit conservative on the starting line. They can't afford another bad race, but they can be on the podium if they get the race right today. Okay, well, we're looking at the live shot out 
in Biscayne Bay. And you can see there's not a huge amount of breeze. We're forecast for eight knots, a light northeasterly. Almost no sea state out there. It's getting warmer in Miami over the past uh, few days. It's now up to 26 degrees Celsius, 78 Fahrenheit in old money. So we are fully expecting this race to happen. The race committee has just called a short postponement really to allow the fleet to gather around and to get there because they have quite a long way to get out onto the race court. Of course, the, the race officer, Carl Shellback, has moved the whole course a little bit south off Miami just to uh, find the wind, doing a bit of wind hunting. And I have to say, we've said this uh, a couple of times, but Carl Schellbach and his PRO team, his race officer team, are doing a wonderful job out there and are running really true and square races. Everyone happy. And it's been a real pleasure to see Carl around the club, chatting to everybody, really opening the, the flow, the lines of communication between the race management and everyone else, which is exactly what you want from a race team. Wow, we're looking at this beautiful shot right there. You can see the water in Biscayne Bay is very flat, very light wind. And, and those sailors are wearing a lot of gear. The skippers have hiking pants on, the crews have their harnesses, and they, they're covered up to keep the sun off of them. So they're getting hot right now. They're going to welcome any breeze that comes down to get this race started, to cool off a bit. Um, but right now, they're just relaxing, trying to keep their focus. And for the people in the middle of the pack, just the last day of a great event. But the guys up there in the top 10, there's some little bit of nerves going. They're trying to figure out their strategy. Some of them have coaches. You can see there's coach boats in the background. Um, so there's, they're gathering information. They're looking at the current and uh, just waiting for a good fair race. Well, Kathleen, in our shot, we can see the city of Miami in the background. Uh, that load of concrete is going to heat up like you wouldn't believe, and we'll get a sea breeze uh, circulating around fairly soon. Now, just while we're waiting for the race officers to set the track and the boats to get out to the start line, uh, after race number five yesterday, we asked the race winners, Charlie Buckingham and Austin Sperry, to come in to our little studio position where we're talking from, the US Sailing Center, and to go through and use the powerful tool of Virtual Eye to analyze uh, some of the moves. So here is what Charlie and Austin had to say to analyze race number five. After race number five, we have invited the winners in to our little studio at the U.S. Sailing Center, Mr. Charlie Buckingham, Mr. Austin Sperry. Congratulations, guys. Super race. Thank you. Thanks, Igby. So we're going to have a little look at the start and get into analysis mode. And here we're replaying virtually from about a minute before the start, and we'll flag up your boat, and we'll see whereabouts you were, and I wonder... Charlie, if you just talk us through the tactics of where you wanted to start. I guess before the start, we were deciding what, what side of the line we wanted to, um, to start at. And I would say at five minutes, we both decided the pin looked good, probably about 10 degrees favored. Um, there wasn't too much traffic. And we had a really good acceleration. McDonald von Schwartz to weather of you, and yeah. they were black flagged. And Augie is, I think he's either, he's he was like, right here. Yeah, he's right there. Um, and both Andy and Augie were black flags, so we must have been right on the line. You are right on it. Okay, so now you begin to poke out. Um, Donald von Schwartz, don't quite know yet, nor does uh, Augie or Bruno Prada. Uh, j that flick is just the... Um, uh, the tracker's catching up with the data, so ignore that. But uh, these guys are out, and unfortunately, Von Schwartz uh, now begins to move away. Now you're in a bit of clean air. Yeah. Especially when I, I, it took a little while for Augie to go away, but after that, we, were, yeah. we, were, we had a really good lane. Okay, so we're going to move up and uh, just speed it up a little bit. Uh, you're not uh, quite in the lead. The furthest, furthermost uh, pin, I think... Is that, that Luke? Was... Luke Lawrence? It could well be Luke Lawrence. Yeah, I think he had an early lead there. But you're in the, in the game there, in the hunt, and uh, in clean wind. And this clean lane. Just talk a tiny bit about the lanes for people watching this. Well, in the starboat, if you can start and have a, a 
hit the line with pace and go long starboard, you're going to come good at the top. You know, everybody's jogging for position. People didn't get off the line. Uh, we were very fortunate. Charlie put us in a great spot. Uh, you can see there on the virtual eye that uh, we had a great lane all the way up. Uh, we did a one-tack beat, effectively started on uh, starboard, went probably a mile, and then uh, we tacked onto port. Unfortunately, we were a little overstood. Uh, so I think it was uh, Dr. Merkelbach and maybe Eric Doyle and John McCoslin who... And Doug Smith, too. Doug Smith, and they, they all started in the ideal spot. I, they were further up the line, and Lee bowed us, yeah. and I think we're top five at the mark. Let's just slow that down uh, ever so slightly. Um, you mentioned that you you'd overstood. Here we have the mathematical yeah. uh, ley lines, the port ley line, starboard ley line, and you'd gone uh, further across that, so effectively sailing a bit more distance. Why was that? Well, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a little bit of current pushing us to yeah. to windward. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Because uh, I mean, we were looking from the top down, and we could see a lot of boats doing that. And uh, obviously, that's not uh, what you intend. Um, I'm going to just uh, hit pause. So you're happy with your start. You're in the top five. You're around there. How key is it to get a, a really good first beat in a in a 72 boat fleet like this, Charlie? <laughs> Uh, it's it's critical. I think if you can get off the line clean and you have good speed, and you're just able to hold on starboard for, as I guess, have a good lane, keep that speed, and not tack too soon and get tacked on, I think you'll be in pretty good shape. And Austin, that was interesting, a one tack beat almost. Uh, yeah. So really, every tack maneuver you do, you kind of lose space and distance. They take time. They do. And uh, I, I will say the guys in the middle, we couldn't cross them. So that was one of the reasons why we were a little bit overstood. We were waiting for, I think it was Eric Doyle, to flop. Uh, we went probably a little too far and came back on port. And uh, you know you saw those guys that, that got ahead of us at the weather mark. When, when you overstand in, in the star boat, it's very slow with hard chines. Uh, it's, it's not a very uh, optimal position and a uh, uh, favorable <coughs> mode, if you will, for the boat. So I'm, I'm learning quickly that, yeah, you just go sideways. You don't move forward. Now we are going to jump to the final leg. Okay, so uh, you've already done two laps of the entire track over an hour and a half or so. Uh, and now we're going jumping to the final leg to the finish because it turns into... Uh, a super drag race, and there's you, John McCausland, and Roger Cheer uh, hammering away upwind. McCausland, Cheer, they've got 50 meters over you. They're piling out into fresh, clean air. You've got your lane, as you say. Now, we know you won this race. How, did, how on earth did you overtake McCausland and Cheer? I think looking at the tracker there, we, we had a really good rounding and actually hooked into some, some right pressure. Maybe it was pressure and a little bit of angle that went in our favor. So when he, he his first tack, we gained a lot of distance on him, yeah, wouldn't you I, say? I think that's right. And I, I think you saw we had really good height. So earlier in the leg, uh, we were just gaining on him uh, on that starboard rounding. Uh, we were able to kind of just gauge a little up to weather. Uh, and then you know, he crossed us on port. We protected the left. I think the critical moment was him releasing us and letting us go left. That's right. I, I would like to do something a little strange. We'll come back to this moment. Paul, I'm going to ask you to rewind, if you would. Paul from Virtual Eye. And we'll, we'll find that little moment. I think this is good. I, I actually okay. said... I and said then to slow it right down there. I said to Austin that we were getting close to ley line and that I wanted to start engaging. And then this is the tack where he let us go. Okay, if we slow right down. So he tacks on you there yep. in match racing format and rather good, but he could have tacked on you again. Is that right? Yeah, he had a hard time getting back to us. We, we got some nice pressure over there, and when we came back, I think that's when we, came, we crossed him. And he tacked a lured. And he was choosing to cover us going back right. So when he was down speed, we did another tack back to the left side, and this is where we gained. Was the wind moving at all? Was this helping you out here? I think the wind shifted left, and there yeah. was more pressure coming from the left. Yeah, and the course axis from the start was, uh, I think, 140. And then uh, by the end, it was 150. So it favored the left side. And that's or no, it was, one, one, did it, it, it was it, 130, 130 yeah. 140. Yeah, it was. 
Can I, um, Paul, would you mind if we rewind again just to that moment? Because I, I want to be, I want to get it clear in my head. Because it's quite hard when you're not out there on the racetrack and you're not a tactician uh, and great sailor like yourself to kind of nail uh, a moment like this. Because it looks like this is a, a kind of deciding moment between you coming second and first. So if we go back a tiny bit more, Paul, if we would, to that that moment there. That's so. So go back a tiny bit more, Paul, to that moment. Just here we go. Okay, now if we go kind of real slow into this, just explain it, you know, in, in idiot terms for <laughs> dear old well, diggers here. Yeah, well, we knew we were going to get tacked on there, right? And I mean, that's the right move to, to force us out. You know, from his position, I, it was a call. Do we want the right or the left at the top? And obviously he thought the right was better, so he tacks on us there, forces our hand, and uh, we tack back onto starboard and, and, you know, just get more separation. I think... We got a little bit lucky that he was choosing to cover the right side and let us go left. Yeah. Okay. We had good speed to take advantage of, of good pressure and angle, but I think for sure getting a little bit of leverage left and him not covering us out there helped us a lot. Fair enough. Then we, uh, you, you engage again. You come in. McCall's Island cheer. Come attack underneath you. He couldn't cross us there. Okay. That was a problem. That's why he chose attack there. I think looking back, maybe, I don't know if I was him, I might have ducked us and, and got Tried some to leverage go on the left, left. Yeah. but he, he didn't. So now you're in a straight line drag race, and you've got the, the weather gauge, as we like to say in naval terms, and you're away, and you're beginning to pull out a, a lead on McCall's land and cheer, and looks like you're just making. We weren't sure if you were making the line, the finish line or not, but I think you were, uh, you were enough I think this is a little deceiving number. It seemed closer than that. Okay. Yeah. And then we did one final tack when he tacked just for you know, good measure and uh, a little insurance. He flops. We get in front of him and we go. And boom. There it is. Happy days. Happy days. Buckingham and Sperry racing back to the hoist. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real race. <laughs> that is the real race. I wonder sometimes if we just start the whole race from there, yeah. you know, and <laughs> commentate from there. Um, anything else? Can you add anything else on that race today that's uh, illustrative of uh, tactic strategy, Austin? You know, it was lighter. Uh, it started out in really nice breeze. I think I hiked for uh, basically every weather, every weather leg up until the last quarter of that. I don't know if that had something to do. There was a lot of... Uh, spectator boats, the, the TV boat, so it was a little choppy. The yeah. breeze went a little little lighter. Clouds started coming on the race course. Uh, so it was good to get that thing finished when we did. And final comment, Charlie. I think the left was favored, and we were on the left side every beat, and I, that helped us. I think that, coupled with our speed and good start, made for, made for that race. Well, we enjoyed it very much. We enjoyed talking to you and about you. Uh, thank you very much for coming into our little studio here. Uh, it has lifted you up in the overall standing, so you are within sight of a podium finish at the end of race number six. And I just want to say good luck to you, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Be a good Cheers. Day. Cheers. I love that boom there, the, the <laughs> explosion. It makes my day every single day. Um, Loving the analysis from the sailors. We've done three uh, with Xavier Rohart, Lars Grail, and there, Charlie and Austin. And great to kind of really dig deep and get into what they were doing and to learn a little bit about this, to be fair, complex game. Well, and it was interesting also to have the crew doing the commentary as well now because the crew is much lower in the boat. And normally it's usually one pair of eyes that's seeing one thing, one pair of eyes that's seeing the other. And often you can see a crew and a skipper disagree on the racetrack. And here they're looking at the same thing. And often our view in the studio, looking at the trackers, looking at all the cameras, we have that big picture. But when you're on a sailboat, you're so much lower in the water that you can't see everything. You, you can't see the breeze. You can't see boats across a two nautical mile beat. So this is a really special tool for them to see what happened. And I think a lot of time there's some surprises in there as well. Well, they've enjoyed coming in as well. And Lars was kind of explaining a couple of mistakes that he made and, you know, looking at it and learning from uh, our lovely virtual eye. We can actually look at the live virtual shot now 
of the racetrack. You will notice if you've been watching over the past few days that the course has moved orientation. So the wind has been an easterly direction over the past uh, three, four days. It's now moved northerly. So the racetrack is in a more north, northerly, southerly orientation up and down the coast. Now, the, the complexity of that is that we're expecting a sea breeze to come in and shift everything round to the right. And the boats who are coming down towards the start line, they've launched and uh, they're doing about two knots with the breeze, so going fairly slow. Yes, we've got a big bay here, but there are so many other fleets out there racing. So even though you don't see other trackers around the bay, it is yep. a full bay. And so the race committee also has to be careful of the other fleets that we don't want their race courses to come together and have boats in each other's race courses. Well, that's the virtual view, the live shot from the racetrack, from our TV boat. We have none other than the famous sailing journalist, Mr. Louis Habib, with the famous sailing commentator, Miss Jenny Tullock. Louis, Jenny, um, welcome. Hi, good to have you with us. You've been listening a little bit to our chitter about the orientation of the course, and right behind, we can see not a great deal of breeze right now, Louis. Yeah, just quickly on that, um, if you look out to the southeast, there is some darker water. The breeze is due to clock that way, so perhaps we're waiting for some of that sea breeze to come in and it moved from where it is now, which is about northeast. So uh, it's on the move now. But yeah, lo just looking at the points, Jenny, um, Mendelblatt is pretty clear to me. He comes first or second, he's won the Bacardi Cup. Um, in second place, Rohart. We asked him this morning at breakfast, he said, you want to be fast as a cheetah or as hunting as a shark? And, uh, and he said, definitely fast as a cheetah because he's got to, he's got to basically not have Mendelblatt down in third and win, and then he'll win the Bacardi Cup. But then you've got this melee going on behind, and, and George Zabo and uh, Eduardo Natucci, they need Mendelblatt to come sixth and uh, for them to win it. So... It's quite a complicated picture, and as we heard uh, Mark Menderblatt say on that interview, we're going to see how it develops. Well, we are going to see how it develops. I mean, first, as you said, we need the breeze to develop a bit more. So you guys can tell, you were talking about it earlier, Digby, but the sailors are coming downwind from, essentially, from the city, from the skyline behind us, and that means the breeze is, yeah, left of where it has been normally, about 50 degrees, it's north, and we do, I think, need to see it clock towards the sea breeze before we'll really see it fill. So the race committee, Carl Schellbach, he's been doing an awesome job this week. He thought we'd be able to go right on time, and originally when we came out, there was actually maybe enough gradient to have started. There just weren't any sailboats because it's taken them a really long time to sail all the way downwind in this relatively light air from the club. So we're waiting, as you could tell, the fleet getting behind us, but there's still probably half the fleet left to go to come out to this race course. And it's hot already. I mean, I think it might even be hotter than yesterday was, and there was no wind at all yesterday at the start of the day. But we do know for sure that the forecast has said it should clock right, it should build, we should definitely get a race off. We have a time limit of 2 p.m., and that's a hard time limit, so they can't start a race after that. So we're all going to be eyes on the watch, three hours to go, counting down. And I think everyone's going to be a little bit nervous coming in now with this light air, with the breeze not developing the way that they had expected so far. But often, as sailors, we know that that's actually what happens when the gradient's a bit stronger than you want. You kind of want the gradient and the sea breeze to develop together and go clocking right. But if the gradient's too strong and from maybe a tiny bit too far left, then it fights the sea breeze. And so what we're having now is this fighting area. We have one good cumulus cloud out here, which is helpful. It wasn't there at 9 o'clock. We've got a lot of fluffies around behind us. So I think we'll see some great racing. We'll get some insight from Luca Modena soon. I think I'm, I'm going to be able to hop on his boat, so we'll get to hear from him exactly what he thinks. But you spoke to him this morning. He gave you a little insight about what he thinks is going to happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, what Luca was saying is that uh, one thing for sure is we've got a tide which is heading north all day. So uh, that's going to be the direction of the tide. And what he focused in on was the downwind. And what he thinks will happen on the downwind is we'll see the boats go down the right-hand side uh, on the downwind, um, probably to about halfway, and then time the jibe uh, so that they're, uh, they're running with the current. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he seemed to focus in on that, and maybe that's where, you know, the game could be won and lost today on the, on the downwind. 
Well, and it could be, we saw yesterday, it could be the way that the guys are getting out from those bad starts. Xavier has not actually really ever led at the top mark. He's been coming from sort of 20th middle right of the line and then just and pushing their way through the pack. I think actually they rounded 10th yesterday, so they weren't that deep. But they're, they're making big moves out there. It's a very long racetrack, so the guys who are fast and have speed and have good tactics downwind and, and definitely the left side's been paying upwind as well have been able to push through the, fact, the pack and we'll just see what happens today. It's going to be very interesting, Jenny. Thank you, Louis. Jenny, well, fingers crossed that we get this race underway and uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of stick my neck out and say that it is going to happen because it, this is kind of what we had Go. yesterday. It all died yeah, off a little bit. Be, Carl, yeah, the race really officer, great. held everyone ashore okay. and then uh, away we went and we got a really good race underway. So if you're watching at home, stick with us. Uh, we've got some good stuff, some good in interviews coming up and uh, some interesting chats on Skype about all kinds of things. Uh, we're here in the US Sailing Center. We're under postponement for the finale of the Bacardi Cup, race number six, almost heading up. Jenny's going to jump onto the little rib and run around and talk to Luca Medena, uh, who is the World Championship winning coach. And Luca's been bang on with the weather all week, and it's been r really hard to judge. And we've been picking Luca's brains, and uh, Jenny can go out, talk to Luca, and uh, explain a little bit about how the thermal sea breeze, the thermic system works, which is uh, pretty cool. Now, just before we do that, I managed to catch up with Mark Mendelblatt uh, yesterday during that postponement. So we had a little sit down, a little chat, and I asked Mark and I asked Xavier Rohart, the two top skippers here, uh, to talk a, a little bit uh, about Mark because he's very elusive. He, he kind of turns up and he disappears and he fades in and he fades out, and yet he keeps turning up and winning. He's an incredible sailor. So let's get a little insight into who is Mark Mendelblatt. Is sailing your life, is this a full-time thing for you? Yeah, it is. Um, I'm a professional yachtsman or sailor, whatever you want to call it. Um, I am paid to go racing on uh, boats by owners and uh, that's what I do. Travel around a lot and do a lot of regattas. How does this star sailing and uh, you know things like we, we're doing for the Star Sailors League, how does the star sailing fit into all that? Well, it fits in nicely. I mean, for me, um, doing the finals in um, December is great in Nassau. It's close to home, hour and a half flight for me. And um, to do this Bacardi Cup is fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I've always put the star sailing as a priority in my life since I got into the class in 2004. And, and uh, it's great to be able to do it on a sort of professional level like uh, it is with the Star Sailors League. Um, uh, the fact that uh, Michelle and Xavier have stepped up and created this is fantastic and that we can go race for prize money against such great sailors and in these boats is, is great. Mark uh, on the water is um, always on the good side of the, the tactics and the strategy. Uh, most of the time he's starting really well, so you know he, he will be there on the top mark. He will be ready for the fight. Yeah, he has all the fundamentals of the sailing, so it will not give you any breeze. <laughs> so, and it will do it uh, in the perfect way, not too much and not too stressful. It doesn't uh, push you too hard, but it's pushing you. So it's what we call a gentleman sailing. In sailing, what, what drives you, what motivates you, what, what pushes you forward? Well, you know, these days it's, it's a little bit of making a living yeah. um, you know I have got to you know support myself and my family and, and, and try and earn a living like anyone else and uh, so going to regattas and doing a good job for the owners I work for getting good results um, you know that motivates me uh, to do well and work but in regattas like this uh, you know and also those regattas it's about winning you know I mean there's nothing better than winning and um, I've been fortunate to win a few regattas not as many as, as some people out there but uh, you know, really uh, just deciding to do a regatta and deciding that you just don't want to do the regatta, you want to win the regatta is, is, uh, is why I do this. Um, you know, I'm not just doing it to, to participate or be, be out there. Maybe someday, if I'm fortunate enough, I will be able to have that mentality. But, you know, right now it's just, you know, it's about trying to go out and win. We have to be quite uh, aggressive, but he's not going too far. 
never crash board, never yell, never shout. Uh, always there, really strong and uh, and pushing your mind quite away and quite a, quite a bit. So uh, it's, it's really good. Is there a fear of losing? Yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, I uh, to be honest, you know, I don't fear that as much as I used to. I don't know why, but um, there is a fear of losing uh, always. Um, and I think it's just because once you've won, you know how good it feels to win and you want that feeling again. So um, I do fear not winning, uh, you know, and uh, but at the same time, I realize that, you know, there's a lot of great sailors here. Mark is a gentleman and uh, regarding the sailing side is uh, one of the most talented guy you can find. Uh, he can jump on every kind of boat and uh, be successful. Uh, he's a really good tactician. He can, he knows how to make the boat go fast. Uh, but he's still a little bit mysterious. Uh, we don't see him, him often uh, on the uh, on the on the shore. And uh, when he's talking, he's talking. It's so no no problem. And he, I like his family and uh, uh, everything. But he's always uh, a bit a part of the what we are doing. Uh, but I like him a lot. I've never been a guy that hangs around the boat park all that much. You know, I, I've been lucky to have crews who have helped me out with the rigging of the boats and the preparation. Um, you know, that's one of the things that uh, we set up from the beginning. I, you know, I'll tell them, look, I'm not, I'm not the guy to hang out all the time and, uh, and, and, and do all the work, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be there when it counts. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of my style, I guess. Well, fascinating to get to know Mark a little bit more. I mean, he's the local hero here in Miami. Uh, he lives here with Carolina. They have a young son, and he's bases his professional sailing out of here. And it's rather nice of Xavier to talk about Mark like that. And here in the Bacardi Cup, of course, they're two points adrift of uh, winning. You know, uh, Xavier is two points behind Mark right now in the Bacardi Cup. We're in a slight holding pattern because out on the racetrack, uh, very little breeze. It's probably going to shift right. Uh, but we can go out and chat to Jenny. She's jumped aboard with the top sailing coach, the stop top star coach, Luca Modena, or Luca Modena, I beg your pardon. And uh, Jenny, just um, ask Luca what's going on now, and then I wonder if you would pick his brains a little later and just try and get Luca to explain to us how the sea breeze, the thermic system works for people who are a, a little bit newer to sailing. Okay, um, so Luca, Digby's asking, as you can tell, we yeah. don't have much of a sea breeze right now at all. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's gotten glassier as we've come out. So he's saying, can you use your expert opinion and explain to us how a sea breeze works, how it builds to an audience who might not understand the concept yeah. of a sea breeze? Oh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Actually, we have a small problem here on the bay. We have a gradient wind coming from uh, northeast and usually is not working well and helping the sea breeze. What the sea breeze does is the heating of the land is get uh, going the hair over the surface and then get it take it again from uh, the gradient back to the to the ocean and then this uh, warming up uh, close to the water surface and coming back again this is the the circulation of the sea breeze uh, we are waiting uh, that that can be arriving uh, around maybe 45 minutes one hour and actually all the element is pretty well but since we are coming out here on the bay it seems like uh, we need to be really patient and uh, wait i'm pretty sure that we have an exciting ending regatta here on the bay today well we've gotten good at being patient so far this week i think and it's and it's worked out every day that we've needed it too we've been patient out here the sailors have been patient and then we've gotten some amazing racing which has made yeah. an incredibly tight scoreboard at the top yeah. you know the right. top three yeah. especially very tight the top yeah. five even anyone yeah. could win yeah. you know a lot of them as well from having personally coached them yeah. who do you think does the best when the pressure is on uh, you know usually it's the most experienced guy uh, take advantage or, uh, over this element and uh, over that is gonna that the regatta will be playing less than 10 knots maybe and just take advantage to the specialist of light airs. So 
it's really tight. It's really, if, uh, I, I don't know, if I will play a favorite for the regatta, I will say today against uh, Mark Medved. It was uh, proving during the week that it's more overall uh, uh, well uh, taking care of the bay. It seems like he's not really well the bay. And if I can put my lemon sorbet on, I will put on uh, Mark Medved. I love it. The lemon sorbet. Um, Luca owns a restaurant in Lago de Garta, Restaurante Umberto. Amazing place to be. The lemon sorbet, I think you made me once for my birthday when I was there training in the 49ers. Um, and it's spectacular. It would be the perfect drink for a day like today when we have essentially no wind and a very hot day. Um, what's it made out of? It's made on uh, lemon ice cream and uh, wine uh, prosecco. And uh, the, we use the uh, rum bacardi white for concluding that and just shake it very much and then serve it with a little uh, uh, thinny slice of uh, lemon. So maybe the perfect drink for a Bacardi Cup day. Perhaps we'll see the winners of the Bacardi Trophy take something like that this evening at the, at the trophy ceremony. <laughs> yeah, well, it will be a pleasure maiden for them. Exactly. Thanks so much, Luca. Excellent insight as always. We'll go back to you guys in the studio, Digby. Oh, lemon sorbets. Now, now you're talking. We are in holding pattern right now for race number six of the Bicardi Cup, the deciding race. And as Luca's saying, the breeze is clocking right, shifting round, and we're waiting for it to fill in. Uh, local time, we've just uh, gone past half past 11 in the morning in Miami. The final cutoff to start this race is at 2 p.m., so there's plenty of time to get this race underway, Kathleen. Yeah, I mean, I think the sailors are used to this here in Biscayne Bay. We, as we said earlier in the week, we haven't had a very windy season here. So a lot of times the race committee will keep the sailors on land. We did that a day ago. Um, and that way the sailors stay out of the sun. But this being the last day of the regatta, they want to get the sailors out so they can be there ready to go as soon as the breeze fills in. Um, there, usually there is a time limit for getting a race off on the last day. People have to get, pack up their boats, fly home. So that is another issue but the top guys have got to keep their focus and they're waiting for just a nice fair breeze to fill in and when we say fair we mean a consistent velocity across the race course not overly shifty and uh, a good fair start and, and, and that's hard to do and that's also not totally in the hands of the race committee this is a weather driven sport okay when it rains the tennis players can't play in the rain when there's no snow skiers can't ski but most other sports it's not so weather dependent ours is entirely dependent it it on on the breeze and that's not something that we can manufacture fair enough so one of the developments of the Star Sailors League is something called Challenge the Stars. And it's a using virtual regatta in shore. So this is the gamers world now, and we're marrying up the physical world of these great sailors out in the bay right now with the youngsters and all the gamers around the world, of whom there are vast numbers. The Vendee Globe has attracted some half million players uh, it, during the Vendee Globe and the Volvo Ocean Race, you know, up to about a million. Now we have uh, Jack Griffin on Skype. Uh, Jack, hi, if you can hear us. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where you are in the world. It looks uh, really nice, like a little chalet. Jack, um, tell us where you are in the world, and then I wonder if you could explain what is this uh, Challenge the Stars, the, uh, the virtual regatta in shore? Sure thing, Louis, or, sir, or Digby, sorry. How are you no doing? No problem. Good to see you as well. Glad to see there's good racing going on there. As you can see, I'm in beautiful downtown Miami. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm in Verbier, Switzerland. I had a good day out on the slopes today uh, with my standard way of skiing, which is to hike up with climbing skin. So I got my exercise in already. It's 5.30 in the afternoon, but let's talk sailing. So as you said, um, you know, we have already, we've seen the great success of the virtual game for the offshore sailing, and now we want to bring it for inshore sailing as well. Um, Thank you so much for classifying me among the youngsters, because you talk about the youngsters wanting to play the game, and I certainly like to play the virtual game as well. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to have a ranking system so that the people who participate in the online version of the virtual regatta for inshore will be able to race amongst themselves. They'll be able to race against the stars, members of the Star Sailors League 
uh, legion of sailors will participate in these online regattas as well. We'll have regattas, online regattas, at real-world regattas. So there will actually be events at regattas, at boat shows, and also at lands, at big gaming events, because what we want to do with this is expand the awareness of sailing, the awareness of the Star Sailors League, the heroes of today in our in our you know wonderful sport, and get everybody playing this game. And the culmination of this thing will be in December. It's the fifth annual Star Sailors League finals that will be in Nassau, and we will have the first virtual sailing finals in Nassau. There will be prize money. We will bring in to Nassau, just like we bring in the top sailors, we'll be bringing in the top virtual sailors as well. And having just a fantastic event, we'll get lots of exposure for that, certainly. But in the buildup to it, we're going to have a great amount of fun playing online with the virtual regatta inshore. Really, really excited about this development. The outreach that it'll give us, people who are where maybe it's a little too cold for them to be sailing right now. Maybe they don't have a boat or access. Maybe they've never tried sailing. But we know already from the offshore sailing that the game attracts people and that broadens the audience for our great sport. Jack, fascinating. And uh, just very briefly, how do you get involved? How do you get involved with this? Well, we're in the final phases right now of developing the game. We're working with the folks who developed, who had the, the virtual regatta offshore. We'll have a massive communications uh, program with all of the usual social media, website, email newsletter, uh, media releases, and we'll be getting the word out to uh, as broad a collection of sailors and, of course, non-sailors and gamers to really build the audience for this. Okay, so as far as I know, if you go to the website starsailors.com, uh, there is a tab up there. Seb was showing me yesterday, and it says game, and, and that's your, your, your intro. That's the place to get started. That's the for right now. And what we'll be doing is with our other communications channels is we'll be in, inviting people, encouraging people, driving people to that page and to that link to click. Jack, exciting development coming up uh, to be able to take on other gamers in the Bahamas. It's such an amazing, wonderful place, as you and I know. And Kathleen, uh, that's a pretty cool concept, great competition. Listen, I'm going to say cheerio. I love the backdrop there of your chalet in Verbier, a bit of snow. It's really hot here. It's 26 degrees in Miami, in Biscayne Bay. We're in holding pattern. But for now, thanks so much for joining us, Jack. Yeah, Digby, great talking to you. And good luck to all the sailors out on the water and the race committee to get in that last race. Cool. Adios from Verbi. It's like CNN, isn't it? You know, everyone sure. popping up on Skype and giving us news. It's marvelous. Uh, so if you've just joined us, we're in a slight delay. We're in holding pattern to start race number six, the finale, the final deciding race of the Bacardi Cup. I'm here with lovely Kathleen Tock in the U.S. Sailing Center, and uh, we're chatting away, we're going through analysis, we've heard from Luca about the weather, well, it's clocking right, uh, but we are waiting for race number six to crack on. Well, I'm excited about today. It's not often that you get to see a big regatta like this live on television. Many of our sailors have never experienced the SSL. We've seen we have a 70-plus boat fleet here, and these sailors are new to the SSL, and just the media that the SSL is broadcasting to the sailor world and the greater world out there is something very new and very exciting. And we have these bird's-eye views from the trackers, from the cameras, from the drone, and that really brings life into the sport. And it is a difficult called sport to watch so a lot of people don't know about it they don't understand it and that's what we're here doing explaining to people people who know sailing and don't know sailing because it is exciting is different but it's like a chess game on the water it's not just pure speed like auto racing 
Well, this is the 90th edition of the Bacardi Cup. It started out in Havana, and now it's moved to Miami, Biscayne Bay. And let's have a look at the previous winners here. Kathleen, you can talk us through this a little bit. Okay, we see the number one ranked most winning sailors, Ding Schoonmaker. And actually, the building we're standing in right now is the Schoonmaker Sailing Center. Ding is a longtime star sailor. I think he won this event over four decades. He actually won it in 1951 in Havana, Cuba as a youngster, as a crew, but then won on to win it seven more times as a skipper. And Ding lives in Florida today. He's a legend. He's just been a big time supporter of the class, followed by closely by Mark Reynolds, multiple Olympic medalist. But there you go, seven time winner of the Bacardi Cup over three decades. Um, unfortunately, Mark isn't here. He works for Quantum Sales, and currently they have one star boat, and he's been kind enough to give it to George Zabo, one of his colleagues at work. Um, so George is here racing instead of Mark. Um, Mark is often accompanied by a great cruise, Hale Hanel, but none other than Magnus Lidgetal, who you see just below Vince Prune. As a crew, he's won it five times. So if Magnus wins with Mark Mendelbach today, that he'll bump him up to number three there, tied with Vince Prune. Our great colleague and co-commentator Tyler Bjorn from Canada has been emailing me and saying, talk about the cruise, talk about the cruise. <laughs> and that's great because there is Magnus Liljal, top crewman in that leaderboard. Well, you know, I was uh, doing some research on Magnus today and looking for some good photographs. And Magnus is always accompanied by the best. Vince Brun, Mark Reynolds, Augie Diaz. Um, he's always with great sailors like K-Art. Everybody wants Magnus on board. Every decade, Magnus Lidgetal is there. So maybe another win for Magnus will bump him up. Vince Brun, as we've mentioned, originally from Brazil, now lives in San Diego, a sailmaker for North Sales. A lot of success in this cup. Now he's mostly a coach, pro sailor. And then down, uh, Adrian Islin II. That's a very famous family in the sailing world. Um, the Islins were very involved in the early America's Cup in the 30s, the very big J-class boats. Um, he won the very first, the inaugural event in Havana, Cuba in 1929 and went on to win it again. Ross McDonald of Canada has won it four times, mostly in the 90s, and he normally sailed with Tyler's brother, Kai Bjorn. So, very successful sailor, not in the starboat these days. He's off doing pro sailing. Um, Harry Nye was from the early years, I believe around the 50s, and then you've got Bill Buchan with three wins also. And Bill Buchan is a, an Olympian, a great sailor from Seattle. He has some family members sailing in this event right now. Followed by Peter Wright, also I believe in the, in the 70s. And then Peter Bromby of Bermuda, famous sailor, a very larger than life man. Uh, Magnus accompanied him in one of his wins. Um, and the thing about Peter Bromby is, as you said, he's large. What you need to know about the Bacardi is in most star events, there's actually a weight limit. We know the stars are very heavy boats. Um, it helps to have heavy people on the boat to control it and keep it flat and going fast. And Peter Bromby is probably one of the largest skippers. Um, so he couldn't normally sail with a crew like Magnus in a normal regatta, but could come to Bacardi where they didn't have to weigh in and uh, win the event. But a still a tremendous legend in the sport of sailing from Bermuda. Hell Hanel, hello, here we go, Hell. We call it, like to call him Hollywood. He works in the film industry. Hell is a crew often on board with Mark Reynolds. He's an Olympic medalist with three wins. And as we mentioned previously, Kai Bjorn won mostly with Ross McDonald. He is from the Ottawa area, the brother of Tyler, our co-commentator. Tyler, we miss you. We know you're in Mexico. Wish you were here. And then followed by Mark Mendelblatt, who today is looking to get one more win. Bump him up there into three wins. He'll be in good company. Um, Mark's won it twice, I believe, with Mark Struby and Magnus. And then Lars Grell has won it two times in 2014 and 2015. So with a lot Sam of great names. Chalvis, his, yes. his crew here, who's here now. Exactly. Okay. So, so Sam's name should be there as well. <laughs> Sam's name should be there. Okay, so well, that's uh, some skippers and crews, uh, some of the top ever Bacardi Cup winners. And uh, just below that list is, of course, Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau. They won it, won it in it, 2013, I believe. Who have won it once. Uh, so within the top three, we have two previous winners. George Zabo, his name isn't there. He hasn't won the Bacardi Cup. He's now sailing with uh, Eduardo Natucci. And they are third on the leaderboard, just five points 
from the lead. So very, very tight and uh, a lot of glory at stake for the Bacardi Cup. Yeah, it's exciting. I think also Xavier, even though he's won it, I remember that year, the prize giving, he had to fly out. So Pierre Alexei was the one who accepted the trophy. So Xavier never really held that on the podium. So it could be very special today if he can beat Mark Van der Talking of Xavier. After race number one, we asked Xavier Rohart, one of the founders of the Star Sailors League. He's one of the top coaches for the French National Federation, and he and Pierre Alexis won race number one in more breeze. And this is pretty cool, this analysis. And uh, let's see how Xavier breaks down race number one with virtual eye. Well, post race number one of the Bacardi Cup, I'm here with Monsieur Xavier Rohart, French Olympic coach, bronze medalist in the star, and uh, you've just won this first race, and you're going to help us do some race analysis. Uh, Xavier, let's uh, just hit play and check it out. Race number one of the Bacardi Cup. Let's go. Here we go. So we're going to start about two and a half minutes, and we're going to speed this up throughout. But I thought we'd pick a few names here and uh, just pick some people who started at the pin end, the middle of the boat, middle of the line, and at the committee boat end. And you, uh, with uh, Pierre Alexis, are on the committee boat. Take it away. So what is really showing this, uh, the, the four boats is um, as far left you go on the start, as uh, the more aggressive you are on the, uh, the aiming of winning the, the race. For sure, everyone knows we have to go left. There is more pressure, the clouds, everything was there. Uh, the current was quite even. Uh, but the thing is, uh, if you start here, you have to be really accurate, like uh, Mark did, and uh, really fast. He nailed that start. <laughs> he nailed that start for sure, yeah. And this is more secure place to start you know you have board end. committee board in but in this group you know, it's very nice to also to to start quite well so we decide with Pierre Alexis to be really on the right because if something happened you are still in the game if you are on the other end it's really uh, too too risky so that's what what happened we get uh, 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 last was too high for us so just with a uh, one tack and you are on almost on the same position as uh, where you are after the start so the aim for us was just only to be uh, top 10 on the first upwind mark and then you see what's going on where are the opportunities so everything was uh, like previous uh, like what, what we, th we thought the boat that could start and go to left was uh, leading the race and uh, we decided to tack under because uh, still there was uh, some good pressure coming from the right so and we were balancing but finally we decide to have a, a bit of an ag aggressive mode and going to take the uh, the starboard the, the port lay line and uh, it was really good because we catch a, a good number of meters on the, the top guys. Well, there's the recorded shots of the first uh, three boats going around that top mark. Your boat number four and happy days. <laughs> yeah, happy to be there. The plan was uh, really, really good. Uh, we knew that uh, we were, we, sh we should be quite uh, fast downwind. So it was, the idea was to be just before the pack and free hair. So we decided straight to go on the, with on the right hand side facing downwind. More pressure here. Towards the right? Yeah, towards there. And uh, really easy. Get separation with the other boat and be free to, to do the techniques and uh, everything. Sella and Trinta get into a little problem. They lose space by going down the middle. Is that because they're being blanketed from behind or? Yeah, middle is uh, always uh, critical. There is a... Uh, big shadow coming from behind and the wind is always going around you like this so when now you are a big split mm -hmm. you go left Mendelblatt Liljal heading right so that was the the plan <laughs> be aggressive on the second upwind so we decide full left as far as we can 
And we were surprised that uh, Mark didn't uh, follow too quick. Too quick. And he, he stays a long time on the right side and uh, he, he loses a lot. And I think he loses the race exactly on, the, on that moment because he was faster than us and with better, better pointing. So around the top mark on the second lap. Happy days, Les Francais <laughs> in the lead, you and Pierre Alexis. No, I tell you that we were exhausted because we, g we gave everything on the second upwind. We gave all the resources we had and uh, it was really painful, I can tell you. And normally on this downwind, they changed uh, the mark, so it was straight downwind and uh, we knew the, that uh, Mark will gain a lot on this downwind. I've just picked out Charlie Buckingham and Austin Sperry because they were uh, 13th, 14th round that top mark and they claw their way, they claw five, six places on this little downwind leg. How is that? You can see, uh, it's a typical uh, laser and fin sailor. Ah. He's uh, using every wave, you can see, you, you see the snail behind him and he, they are really aggressive on the technique. Lovely. So, yeah. So there you are, almost neck and neck, neck. with uh, Mark Mendelblatt That's and it. Magnus Liljal going around the bottom gate and uh, we have one more leg to go towards the finish. And it turns into a, a duel between you. <laughs> You've got a covering position it looks like here over Mendelblatt and mm -hmm. Liljal. So the, the decision we took here was uh, regarding uh, his uh, ability of speed. Uh, if we continue like this, we had the feeling he will uh, just pass. Then we decide to change mode and going for the wind. Uh, again, going left, again, of uh, better pressure, but we just succeed by... Uh, He's clawed an awful lot of distance <laughs> back on you yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah. And uh, there's you uh, heading up wind and you, you come into this kind of little match race mode. And here. Yeah, that's, it is really aggressive. Huh? You see, uh, every time he take uh, an opportunity and uh, but uh, we were not so happy with our attack. So we try one, two, and then we decide uh, to stop. And uh, after this attack, we, the compass shows we, we were on the, 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 um, the right wind. So <laughs> go left again and again and again. I have to say, I like it from Mark. Mendelblatt because he is really aggressive you he know he takes no prisoners out there exactly and, you know it's like a psychological America's Cup game where he's you know attacking you really yeah, all the time when we knew that so we said okay get rid of it and back on the speed back on the compass mode and uh, then we extend a little bit the lead and it's enough yeah <laughs> Big relief. Yeah, big, 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 big. So a scalp on your first day of the Bacardi Cup, um, which is good news for you and a good, great result for uh, Definitely. Yeah. And every, everyone in that top 10, because you, you, as you said, you wanted to be top mark in the top 10. Yeah. And uh, the other problem is uh, Mark is really good in the light wind too. So every point we can have on him after the, on the strong win is, uh, is a win for us. Okay, Xavier, thank you very much. Uh, that is our Merci race analysis, and we wish you the best of luck in the following races. Uh, for now, uh, bonne nuit. <laughs> I like. Well, if you're just tuning in to our live stream and YouTube stream for the final race of the Bacardi Cup, we're in holding pattern at the moment because the breeze is shifting around, the race course is moving around, the boats are getting towards the start line. We're optimistic that they will run the sixth and deciding race of the Bacardi Cup, but there on virtual eye, you can see where all the boats are around the course, you can see that the course has orientated more to north-south than east-west as we've had over the past few days. But we feel that it's going to move round to the right and we'll see some sea breeze kicking in. Now we've had a question uh, from Sue Noiseda, Noiseda from Connecticut and she wants to know how do the international, the foreign visitors to the USA, how do they get their boats here? How do they get their stars? And I presume, Kathleen, they, um, they fly them in. 
Well, they're definitely not selling <laughs> them. <laughs> no, uh, it's very interesting. Really good question. A starboat can actually fit uh, in a container, maximum starboat, two in a 40-foot container. The problem is the masts are really long, so that is an issue. Sometimes they have to bend the mast to get them into a container. But a lot of the sailors actually have two boats. They'll have, for example, the Brazilians, one in South America and one in Miami for the winter, and likewise for the Europeans. But the SSL is also a great a supporter of the star class and and sailing and so the star class owns boats which they lend out to sailors um, the sailors usually have to fly with their sails it's a little difficult they're very long heavy sails um, and then a lot of the sailors will if they live in for example California that's almost international that's a six-hour flight a lot of those boats get driven over in the beginning of the season and they'll go back at the end of the season um, but it's sometimes it can be difficult Finding a boat here, I, there's a lot of boats um, that are in demand, and also it's hard to charter a boat. You know, everybody has their own nuances with how boats are set up, where their lines are, and so you have to step into a boat that's not your own. It can take quite a few days to get that boat working and set up the way you want to know, you know, is the mast stiff, is the mast bendy? Um, every boat has its, its these little differences that make it big difference in speed and the way the boat performs. So you really want to come to a regatta with your own boat. In that case, unfortunately, you have to put it into a container or own two boats. Rather nice you mentioning that um, Mark Reynolds has lent his boat to George Zabo, his colleague at Quantum Sales. Uh, Mark, seven times winner of this event, and uh, his graciously allowing George to use that boat and have a crack for George with Eduardo to win uh, their first Bacardi Cup. Yeah, we're hoping so. Um, George works for Quantum Sales, and uh, it's really nice to have the different sail makers at these events, um, servicing the sailors, making sure that they're getting good support. And as we said, every day we go out, the winds change, um, and they want to have the right sails up to make them go for us. So it's really good to have George here at the regatta. Um, Mark's probably either watching right now or probably playing golf in San Diego. <laughs> I loved your history bit just now, Kathleen, and uh, you've done your research, and we've been digging out a few pictures and few photos, and the, this the Bacardi Cup started out in Cuba, in Havana, with the Bacardi Cup, uh, with the Bacardi family, and uh, talk us through this picture. This is Havana. This is Havana. Um, this is a neighborhood outside of Havana, very close drive, but it's a beautiful neighborhood. And this is what we're looking at, the Havana Yacht Club, which was the original host of the Bacardi Cup. We said it began in 1929 in Havana. And um, here you have a beautiful dance going on. It was a very incredible time in Havana. The Bacardi family, they were supporters of the sailing. Originally, the, the company started in Cienfuego, but they had some relatives who decided to move to the capital and they had some friends, some of the family, that were involved in the star class. So this is the Havana Yacht Club, the original host. And as we said before, um, the sailors wanted to come down from the Americas to go sailing in Havana because it was prohibition. They weren't allowed to drink. So the Bacardi family welcomed them with open arms in Havana. The Bacardi drinks were flowing, the rum and cokes, and you had the beginning of the Bacardi Cup. But the Bacardi Cup actually was a cup leading into the Midwinter Championship, so the sailors could stay down in Havana for a longer time. Okay, here we're looking at Dr. Carlos Cardenas. He is a world champion in the star class from 1955, world championships held in Havana. He um, has won this event one time, and just a sailing legend in Havana, a member of the Havana Yacht Club. One in the middle? That would be the Commodore of the Havana Yacht Club. Okay. And that trophy actually, I believe, is the Midwinter Championship trophy. The Star Classes has these amazing, beautiful silver trophies, as you will see later on today with the uh, Bacardi Cup. Well, astonishing trophies, actually. And, and the winner of the first race of the Bacardi Cup gets a phenomenally <laughs> elegant trophy as well. And loving uh, the history, we're in the 90th year of the Bacardi Cup. It's one of the one of sailing's oldest trophies, great tradition. The star class uh, was designed 106, seven years ago in the USA. It's been an Olympic class until 2012 in London. Now it's out. Uh, they've gone for more whizzy, uh, they're moving towards foiling, but they've gone for trapezing and spinnakers and all the rest of it. Uh, but the history of this class is gracious and interesting. And I love the Havana shot. Well, this is kind of elegance of the whole scene. You could have worn your seersucker jacket back then. My, my Marks and Spencer special, <laughs> good on them. 
Oh, this is a, a famous shot of the star class. This is 1946, and in the background there, you're actually looking at the city of Havana. And the, the Leaping Star, as it's been titled, um, this is an American team. This, this photo right now hangs in the Lake Sunapee Yacht Club, where there's a, a very old star fleet. And um, this is during the World Championships in Havana. And as the story goes, it is a true story, that the crews, they have this unusual hiking uh, position. They had to hang off the boats. They don't have the straps and harnesses like they have today. And when they came off of this wave, the crew who was actually lying on the deck to keep the boat flat, he uh, broke his ribs. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's Havana in 1946. Awesome. Wonderful history for the Bacardi Cup and the star class. Now, out on the water as the boats and the sailors are in holding pattern waiting for race number six to get underway, here is Jenny, our reporter on the water. I believe you're with uh, Bruno there and some Opti kids and on, on board Augie Diaz's boat. Uh, Jenny, uh, beautiful day and I'm glad you're in the shade. I am very glad to be in the shade as well. You can tell it's not bothered, not bothering the Opti guys, although they are um, all wearing hats, but it's quite hot out here. We are having a very good time. In fact, Augie just had a sail by the race committee boat, and he said, race committee, race committee, requesting a crew change. <laughs> and he's put these three on board instead of um, himself and Bruno. So we're going to have you guys introduce yourselves. This is the camera. You can give them a big wave to everyone who's watching. They're all Opti Green Fleeters who sail for Coral Reef. Yacht Club. Let's hear your name and how old you are. Uh, I'm Jake and I'm 11. I'm Will and I'm 10. I'm Natalia and I'm 12. And Jake, we heard you just won the, <laughs> I love Jake's, Jake's the main sheet trimmer currently and Will's driving but he's actually trying to keep us in frame with you guys which is awesome. Um, you just won the most recent championship, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, was it fun? Yeah, it was windy, it was windy. How windy? Uh, it was like gusting like 27 and it was consistent like 23. Wow, Dude. Oh, that's really good. Good opti conditions. Maybe too much for the star, Bruno. Maybe too much for me. I'm Bruno, 19. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, 19 years old. Right. I'll believe that one when I see it. Natalia, how long have you been sailing? I've been sailing on the team for four years and um, like for uh, summer camps, I've been sailing for eight. <laughs> okay. And Will, is it your first time sailing on a star boat? Uh, yeah, it's my first time, and I've been in Greenfleet for two years. And what do you think of this boat? Awesome. What do you think of it? I think it's a really cool boat to sail. It's fun, isn't it? It goes fast even in no wind. Yeah, it does. Bruno, you have any tips for these kids about star boat sailing? Uh, it's a very nice boat. You, uh, it, it, you can see there is no wind at all, and the... the Maybe one day you arrive in the star class. It would be great. You have to grow a lot, you guys, okay? Yeah. If you want to be a star sailor, you got to be big and strong. You're, you're supposed to say this boat! <laughs> Us! Um, okay, Bruno, and maybe Augie, if you can step back just a little bit. Uh, we do know the points are tight at the top. What is your strategy once we get into the racing here? So I think pretty much first and second are kind of out of reach for us. But I think we, we have an opportunity to, to be third if we have a good race and the other guys thinks guys fall into place. But it's going to be a tough uh, race because there's about six or seven boats, I think, that are, can all do well. So it'll be very interesting, you know, uh, race for sure and I think uh, if the people hang in and are able to watch then uh, they're gonna have a great show okay Bruno um, do you have any different thoughts to Augie about I know I know Augie said he didn't actually look at the scoreboard he doesn't want to know the points necessarily for this last race did you take the same tactic yeah it's a pretty same tactic same same, same thoughts uh, we need to do a actually the dream would be a bullet win the race and then uh, just wait for the other boats. But uh, we never say that we, our, our strategy is to win a race. We always say that we, we, we try to do top five and, um, and 
and especially try to round the first mark in the top five is make a big difference. So I think this is a good idea. But first we need uh, to wait for the win. It does not look very good. But Augie, as Augie says, it's very good that the, we have some wind in the morning, some north wind in the morning, and now they complete die. And so it's very good for us because if they keep the north, they, the north will keep fighting with the east and maybe delay a lot. So as the wind die completely, I think we have a good chance to have a regatta. Okay, let's hope, let's hope that you guys, fingers crossed, we're going to have a good chance for a regatta. That's the strategy for you guys. Augie, you have raced a long time against Mendelblatt, who's winning, Xavier Rohard in second, and Zabo in third. Between the three of them, who do you think can perform the best under pressure today? I think they're all good under pressure. Uh, I think the, if it stays light like this, I think Zabo has a really good opportunity. He's really quick when it's light. And uh, so it's going to be interesting. And, and I think most of the series, uh, Mark and, uh, and Xavier have been sort of watching each other and staying close. Uh, so it, it, it's a pretty good opportunity, I think, for, for George to jump in there and surprise. But I think it'll be tough. Uh, all three of those guys are going to be at, in the top, so it'll be a matter of uh, really who ends up you know, taking control after the start and is able to finish ahead. All right. Thanks, Augie, for that. Thanks, Augie and Bruno, for letting us all on board. Actually, they let you guys on board first. I just hopped on once it was a party. Um, I'm going to let you kids wrap it up. Do you want to say a final, you're going to have to look in the camera, a final hello to anyone special? Um, nah. Hi, Dad. Yeah. Aww. Hi, Mom, Dad, and look all the, three. Look at the big white camera in the back. Hi, Mom, Dad, and all my three sisters. Aww. Hi, my mom and dad and to my two sisters. And thank you to the Coral Reef Yacht Club program for sending out your Opti kids, even, there was, even though there was no win. I think they're having a blast out here. Thanks to Augie and Bruno for having us all on board. Back to you, Digby. Oh, nice one, Jen. How great to see the youngsters out on the water. Kathleen, you teach uh, a load of these guys at the club next door. Yeah, I'm a part of the windsurfing program, and we see these kids. I know all the kids in the bay. But one of the things that's wonderful about Augie is not just how he performs on the water, but he's a huge supporter of the youth sailors here. And the kids just walk up to him. They, they actually they know he's, he's, he's famous. They don't actually know all of his accomplishments, but he'll ask them. He likes to give them tactical events. Uh, there was a little girl, she was having trouble in the the uh, 29ers at a big international crowd around Christmas time and he actually had her out for dinner to talk about how she should rig her boat, talk about how she should make sure she's getting the best coaching and how to interact. And so he's been a supporter of kids in the Optimist and the Snipe class, all the classes. Also some of our US team members, Charlie Buckingham is a regular guest at his home so that he can stay here in Miami throughout the winter and train. Um, so he has a lot of interaction with the young people and is a major supporter um, with his time, with with boats financially with the younger sailors. I saw some of the Opti kids on Lars Grail's boat as well, just floating through the back of the shot. So rather nice out on the water that our star fleet in holding pattern at the moment, uh, waiting for race number six to kick off. Good to hear Bruno Prada, one of the best star crews on the planet, one of the best crewmen of any class on the planet. He's pretty confident that uh, the sea breeze is going to kick in. Uh, so we have a, a late, the latest cutoff for a start, which is in one hour 55 or so. So we are in uh, holding pattern for the start of race number six. But talking of Lars Grail, we asked Lars to come into our studio to do a, 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 another race analysis piece. He just won that one. And I think this is one of the most illustrative pieces because despite uh, Lars winning, you know, he felt that he'd made a couple of mistakes. And while we were commentating, you know, we were kind of noticing this sort of thing. And then Lars came in and used Virtual Eye to have a really good look. And let's enjoy that analysis from, uh, I can't remember which race it was. I think it was three or four. Race uh, three. Race oh. number four, that's it. So race number four, let's hear from Lars Grail. Well, we're going to carry on our series of analysis of the Bacardi Cup. And here with us in our commentary position, our studio,
studio at the U.S. Sailing Center is none other than Mr. Lars Grell, two times winner of the Bacardi Cup. Thanks for coming along, Lars. We're going to have a look it's at my pleasure. race number four. And uh, we had several attempts to get this underway That's uh, true. today. A lot of delays, a lot of postponements. And I thought Virtual Eye will just have a look at the third attempt of the poor race committee trying to get you all underway. You're all champing at the bit. And let's roll it and have a little look. So here we are, we're a few 40 seconds, we're speeding up a little bit here. Yeah. We will see where you are in a, in a moment, but everyone's pushing. I, I was close to the race committee. Here you can see 12 seconds before one ball has crossed the line and three around here. So middle of the starting line, there were there was a belly for the outside. And do you think some of these guys in the middle were hoping to get away with it a little bit by being blanketed either side by sails so that the race committee wouldn't be able to some, see them? Sometimes, the, the middle of the starting line, you believe you're covered for both ends. But this time, what happened, that, that the both ends were under the line or on the limits. So the middle was on the outside, they could see. And that's probably what happened. Let's replay the successful start. This is the actual start of uh, race number four, and we can cue you up and see where you are. You're right there in that yeah, little bunch. Yeah, that's correct. And so it looks to me like you've got some nice clean air to windward of you, and uh, a couple of people, including Rohan. Yeah, it was right very there. important for us to clean the boat that was on our lured. That boat started uh, slightly better than we did, so we were struggling to, to try to keep our windward once we could kill that boat, we had free spot to cross to the left. Okay, and what's so your game we, plan? We gained some windward. The idea was to start on the race committee and go to the left because yeah. looking the other race courses uh, seems to be like an oval circuit. Formula in the circuit, people were going left, upwind, and coming on the same direction downwind because of wind strings. And here you are carving up into the middle of the track. Roja, Ponceau, uh getting into a little trouble. They went right and now they're coming and following you. Sure. And the early race leaders out here on the left. That's correct. But then uh, getting close of the, of, the, of the left corner, the wind has had a small shift to the right. So I was in the middle. I gained some positions uh, against the people that, that started on the pin going directly on the left corner. Was that a, uh, if we slow right down towards the top mark, that middle position, was that a, a conscious game plan before the start? Yes, uh, middle left was our idea. Start on the race committee, cross and play on the middle left. And it's about the same George Zabel has done. Yeah. He started uh, more on the middle of the starting line. He went left, he crossed us very close behind. Then he took a small puff from the right, crossed us, we were second at that time. So then we, we could uh, catch him back uh, on the upwind mark. Round the upwind mark, there you are in the lead and a uh, few boats behind you. Roja Ponceau, interesting, yes. we, I just and, mentioned and, them. And George Zabel in the second position. George right behind you, first That's and correct. second. And around you go. And almost uh, this is how you, you end up at the finish of the race. You know, once you get up to that top mark in a huge fleet like this, you know, we talk about the rich getting richer. Yes. And, uh, you're, it's you're a just kind of wild capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And away you go. And you, um, we're going to whiz down to the bottom a little bit. Any thoughts? You're pretty much going on in a straight line for it. Yeah. I think we, we had a, a good uh, boat speed downwind. And uh, we were trying to protect George Zabel all the time. And as you said, once you were free ahead, all the tactics gets easier because you, you are sailing free with no shade. So there's a tendency to open the gap to the pack with a big group of sailors. So you both jibe at the same time. You are covering George, staying between uh, Zabel and Atucci and the gate, the bottom mark. That's correct. Okay, classic tactics in fleet racing. Uh, and you managed to pull out uh, quite a, a more lead here. You extended your lead. And we know George Zabo is fast downwind. Uh, so what have you got in your back pocket, you know, to go even faster than George? I think we have powerful sails and uh, 
and the way we sail in downwind uh, in a medium light wind we we used to have good good boat speed as we had like the world championship in yeah. buenos aires so it's a condition that we normally perform good and that time we were successful now i was predicting you to go around this mark this gate here yes. and not this one but here you come and refute me and you you take you decide to go for this one why was that because for the position I was before, I thought that was a closer mark to round. Ah. But uh, as soon George rounded the other side, we tacked it before to try to protect the left. But doesn't but that the, mean you have to weave through all this lot here? That was a mistake. We had lo lots of shade from the people coming on, on downwind. And then George is in free as a bird. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Then, uh, then he was able to come back and later on to round the mark uh, together with us. Because he caught right up, almost to your heel, and he had to duck you sure. uh, around that sure. top mark. So uh, it was interesting because we're commentating, you know, as all this is going on and trying to predict what you do, and then you kind of do something else. So and, if uh, you see next time, yep. I haven't done the same mistake. I did the other mark. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Because at uh, that time we we realized that we lost uh, lots of field for George Zabel. I'm going to ask Paul just to speed this one up to uh, the top mark and uh, we'll just see how Zabo, Zabo out here to your left as you look up. There he coming in underneath you. You cover him a little bit and uh, you're doing this little jewel up here, upwind. And, and then the mistake was close to the upwind mark. We, we t tacked to the, to the left and we should have covered him, giving shade. But I was trying to be like more gentle. We 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 tackled on his lured, and we kept going left, ah. so he came back. Okay, so it almost I got America's Cup. I could be here. more aggressive and and tack in front of him. I tackled on his line, was a little yeah. bit uh, lured, and uh, he was getting more pressure coming from the left, so he always catches us back. I'm going to ask Paul to do something a little strange here, yeah, and so just rewind, if you would. Uh, Paul from Virtual Eye is there running the controls. Just go back in time a little bit to that moment just before uh, you decide to do that tack. It's quite interesting what you say there. Yeah, it's illustrative yeah. of us. Because when we were commentating live, we thought that's exactly what yeah. you had done, tack so on him. That was probably uh, the mistake. I was coming on starboard. So I should have crossed him and tacked it right uh, in front of him, giving him shade. But uh, I was trying to be like gentle and didn't work because uh, I gave him uh, sp the, the left spot and the left puffs came from left. Ah. He had more pressure and better angle approaching to the windward mark. So you should have just carried on, yeah. tack on him, give him your ten, exhaust. Ten more seconds I should okay. have gone. Oh, that's I checked it before and that was probably a mistake. The 26 meters gap was getting shorter and shorter almost to the extent as we speed up a little bit towards yeah. the top where he nearly got inside you. Nearly. Uh, for, for a detail, uh, he, he could have gone and tacked on our lure, rounding the mark in, uh, in, on the first. So it's great having you in here straight after the race to analyze this and yeah. uh, talk us through it a, a little bit. Uh, uh, so Fascinating. Um, so once you get up to the top, you, you just maintain your lead. George has to do a little duck. He's not in there uh, close enough. And that's it, really. That's correct. More or less the end of the race. Um, once you're out on front, uh, as we were mentioning, the rich get richer. Uh, you're out in your own clean air, doing your own thing. And uh, it's happy days for the leaders of the race. Just give us a quick impression um, about racing out there and, and the kind of mental game that's going on. That's correct. The, the mental game, of course, because you're sailing against uh, famous sailors, heroes, uh, people with uh, gold stars, silver stars. So they are all prepared to win. So <laughs> the mental pressure, of course, it happens. Eh? So uh, like sailing with George Zabel, sometimes he was trying to, to point in high on downwind, pushing us uh, to love, sometimes trying to, to, to get inside, to, to win the inside jibe for the mark. So we had to, to, to have, uh, have a balance, concentrate, and, and, and try to do the best boat speed as possible. Uh, anything else you would like to add? 
No, I think uh, it was interesting because it was a day that was difficult to make a race. Wind was light. Race committee did a correct postponement. At the end, we had a fair race. Tomorrow, we're going to be even more difficult. The, the wind prediction is to be even lighter. So they, they will probably going to postpone on shore, wait uh, the, the wind conditions to be fair enough, and make a race probably at the end of afternoon, I guess. Well, Lars, thank you very much for joining us in our studio. Thank President of the Star Class, two times winner of the Bacardi Cup with Sam Conchalves. Thank you very much and uh, good luck for the next two races. You're in contention. You're in sight of another Bacardi Cup. I hope Cup. I have a chance to come here because if, if we come here, it's because we won a race. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will it. see you again. <laughs> we hope. Cheers. Thank you. Well, there was Lars Grail analyzing race number four a couple of days ago. And uh, really kind of interesting to get these sailors into our studio and break down a little bit about what they're thinking, the strategy of this game. Fascinating. Now, we've had a, a question, uh, another question from online from, uh, is it Jean, who's uh, asking about star makers and stars in the Olympics. Ha has the star been in the Olympics? Indeed, it has. Uh, the star started out in the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles and then fairly consistently until 2012 in London in the UK. Uh, and now it's been moved on, the game's moved on, the IOC and the World Sailing, the governing body of the sport who decide which classes of the 10 classes are in the Olympics. Uh, they've all voted uh, for uh, different classes uh, to allow some of the trapezing boats to come in the skiff style of sailing. We're in the 90th Bacardi Cup here in Biscayne Bay and out on the racetrack in holding pattern is none other than Jenny Tullock. And Jenny is with George Zabo and Eduardo Natucci. Now these guys, just to let you know, are third on the leaderboard. They are within striking distance of the top two. So uh, all to play for. And if the top two get engaged, we've seen George Zabo, the crafty San Diegan, move around and win. So over to you, Jenny. He's saying striking distance of the top two, Zabo. Um, striking the, distance? Yeah, strike. Oh, do you disagree? Uh, if we win the race today and Xavier gets a fourth and Mendelblatt gets a seven, uh, we could win the regatta, but we'll see how that turns out. It's pretty, pretty light conditions. We've got to get enough wind to go sailing. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, you know, maybe an hour and a half before we can get a start off before the time limit for the day and see if we get a win today. Well, we just got the beginnings of tendrils of wind, right, Dodo? I mean, in fact, we're hearing here. the Let's race listen. committee chat for the first time in the last two hours, and you can see the sails trying to backfill. So maybe, Dodo, a little bit of breeze on the race course now? Maybe. Looks like three knots, maybe, yeah. from zero. Three, four. We're going racing. three, four knots. We got more yeah. wind close to, the, um, close to downtown, but feels like the, the breeze coming in. I mean, the hard part here is, as, they've, as they said earlier, Carl Schalbach, the um, PRO for the star class, has said that we have to be this far out because there's the three other courses racing in there, and we have this really, really long um, race course that we need to race on. At the same point in time, I had a conversation with John McCausland this morning about how the top guys can make it through the fleet even if they've had a bad start. I mean, you guys haven't had necessarily the best starts every time, but Xavier was the one I was mentioning at the moment when we had the conversation. He's sort of not, not been anywhere close to the line at points and then come through to be top five or something. Is it just because the longer courses allow the faster boats to get out and run and make it back into the top? Yeah, definitely boat speed is pretty key. When you have two-mile beats and two-mile runs, boat speed definitely helps a significant amount. So it does allow the faster boats to get up there a little bit. We're short course racing, it's one shift. But, you know, leverage is also dangerous. On a two-mile beat, you know, if one guy goes all the way left, one guy goes all the way right, there's a lot of leverage. So you got to make sure you're going the right way as well. Okay. No one out here is going to hear this. No one out here racing is going to hear mm -hmm. this before the race. So the other day we came to you. You said he's the strategist. He's letting you know what he <laughs> yeah, wants. He was joking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I don't believe it. I'm sure a lot of the strategy comes from you. I promise none of the other racers will know the answer to this. So you can tell us in the audience 
What is your strategy? What will be your strategy if we do see the breeze build enough to go racing? Honestly, we still don't have any strategy because uh, no wind. The forecast says more right turn, but looks like no wind at the moment. So we have to rebuild everything from zero and understand what the tendency is. We were talking about this offline right before they came to us, that it's a bummer because all the actual forecasts showed it going from north at about 11 knots and then just slowly clocking right, clocking right and staying at about 11, 9 to 11 knots. And obviously that's not the reality. That's kind of, no. No, <laughs> no we woke up this morning, government got ahead, you know, 12, 14 knots out there. And that's not that far away. It's lighter in the bay, but we haven't seen any of that yet. And definitely clocking right's been the thing. So all the guys want to go right today, but it hasn't even been enough wind yet to do a wind shot. There is now, but there hasn't been until about 10 minutes ago. So we'll see what turns out there. You know, it's, it's still, you got to get off the line, get a good start, and then find that first wind shift and see where the race sorts out. You know, it'll be interesting to see if, you know, is Mental Black going to go after Xavier or vice versa? But if they go after each other too much, then, you know, Augie or Lars or us could sail around the outside. So, it's still a tough game out there. You might be a happy camper if they come, go after each other. <laughs> no, I doubt they'll go after each other too hard, but yeah, you know, they got to be careful. Okay, so ultimately we are waiting for the sea breeze to build, you guys. I do feel for the first time like we actually have breeze. We're moving a lot faster. Yeah. It's feeling nicer. We're moving. We're moving. <laughs> yeah. um, it, seems, it seems like maybe in the coverage at least, if not in reality, that the left has ultimately paid a lot this week. They just did a replay of you guys and Lars Grail's fourth race. I know yesterday Charlie Buckingham was able to get by John McCausland on the left-hand side in a little tacking duel. Mm -hmm. They just got a touch of leverage, and maybe he said they'd been higher all day, so a touch of leverage meant they were able to just stick a lee bow and stay high and take the win. Um, do you feel like the old man's highway is in play this week, or is it really, it could be either side of the race course? It certainly has been, you know, the, the, a few days ago we had no breeze down here and a lot of breeze up near the city, so it's definitely been more breeze on that side of the bay every day, and you know, who knows, maybe today will be the first day the right comes in. <laughs> All right, keeping your options open, I like it. Well, I'm glad I didn't get in your heads and tell you the left's gonna pay. No, it won't happen. Thanks, you guys, so much. Let's hope we get this breeze actually filling, and we'll go back to you guys, Digby. Jen, just before we leave you, um, I wondered if you could ask Eduardo to your left, to our yeah. right. Um, just Eduardo, he's here to gain. There are a lot of points at stake at the Bacardi Cup in the Star Sailors League rankings. And I, I know chatting to Eduardo that he's really keen to get to the finals in Nassau in December. I just ask. Dodo, how special is that SSL final in the Bahamas? Okay, so Digby's just said there's a lot of points at stake here for the SSL finals, and he wants to hear from Dodo <laughs> how badly you want to be back at the SSL finals again, and are you concerned about racking up points? I would like this competition finish very well for us to come back in Bahamas and have the great final ever, and that's it. <laughs> And you, George? Everybody likes going to Nassau. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. We all like going to Nassau. It's a bit like this. It's warm. <laughs> it's sunny. Although maybe we have more breeze there right on time every day. Yeah. We've been lucky the last few years, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. We'll probably do for a breezy one. <laughs> all right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much. Best of luck when you get racing. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, George. Thank you, Ed Eduardo. Um, I'm going to fire up the overall points. I'm pretty sure we're going to go racing. Let's fire up the overall rankings, the leaderboard, because these guys there, George Zabo, Eduardo Natucci, are on 18 points. They are five points adrift of the leaders, Mendelblatt and Lil Jarl, who are two points ahead of Xavier Rohard, Pierre Alexis Ponceau. So, Zabo kind of mentioned something quite interesting, and this is what I've actually kind of put my money on, that George will be able to sail past Mendelblatt and Rohart, who might engage each other. They, they seem attracted magnetically to duke it out and duel. And we have seen George Zabo in previous SSL events, uh, the Grand Slam on the lake. This is precisially what happened in the final. Uh, the leader, lead two, got engaged, and George craftily played his own game. He's a really, really super, super clever sailor with a great crewman there, Eduardo Natucci. Let's never discount Lars Grail and Sam Conchalves, two times winners of this Bacardi Cup in fourth position. 
They're just five points, five race places from top. So if Mandelblatt Rohard have a, 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 a bad start, Zebo managed to get ahead, Grell and Conchavis have a really good day, then we could see them at the top a little bit. It is possible. I know Augie Diaz and Bruno Prada, Augie was um, pretty sure that he was out of touch, 10 points behind the lead, but never discount the reigning world champions, the reigning world star champions in fifth spot. Definitely, uh, they are gunning for the podium. Charlie Buckingham, Austin Sperry in sixth there with McCausland and Cheer in seventh. Ivan Mellaby, Josh Repkind, eighth. Doyle in Feliz, ninth. Lawrence and Coleman, the youngsters, in tenth. Yeah, now, that's, that's quite a lineup there. You look at the number of world lineup. champions and Olympians. And uh, as we mentioned before, if the top two boats get into their own duel, um, just trying to put one or two points, um, those boats, the other boats can sail around them. So they, Mendelblatt and Rohart, have to also keep their eye on the big picture so that Grail, Diaz, or Buckingham don't go around them. But Mendelblatt and Rohart, they're going to be working really hard. Xavier has to get three boats between him and Mendelblatt to walk away with the Cardi Cup for the second time. Okay, and as we lose the leaderboard, we're looking at the live shot on the water, and you can see the patches of breeze beginning to fill in. That is the sign of the sea breeze filling in. It's moving round to the right, but it's still going to take a few minutes for this breeze to fill in completely and be consistent. Now it's at 78 degrees and around 3.5 knots. We have an anemometer, a wind instrument on our TV boat out there. So that's the real live 3.6 knots. That is the wind speed and that's the real wind direction. It was northerly. It was near to the 0, 010 degrees and now it's clocking round as we've been predicting all day to 80 degrees more easterly. And I suspect it might go a little further than 90. So stay with us. Uh, we suspect that we'll be racing within the half hour. What we're going to do is uh, just replay the final of the SSL finals in Nassau in the Bahamas, which is why I asked uh, Eduardo. I know that there are 3,000 points on the table here within the Star Sailors League, and it's the biggest point scoring championship of the year, even more so than the World Championship later on in the year. And the top 10 in the Star Sailors League qualified to get to the final, and then the rest are VIP guests from the world of match racing, offshore racing, laser sailing, 470 sailing, Olympic class sailing, and all the rest for which the star is unusually suited to invite uh, star sailors and VIP guests to race. So stay with us. Do hold our live stream and YouTube stream in a little window because we suspect that we will be racing within about half an hour. But this little highlights package is 25 minutes and it's the best of the best in Nassau just last December. Five teams. 16 Olympic medalists. Two America's Cup winners. Two Volvo Ocean Race winners. One World Match Racing Tour champion. Five days of racing. Ten boats qualify for the final day. Eight in the quarters. Six in the semis. Four in the finals. $200,000 prize money. That's our Christmas bonus. Not in my house. With this level of sailors, we're all here to win. And we love this brutal format a lot. Welcome to the Star Sailors League Final. This is the fourth time Nassau, the capital of the stunning 700 Coral Islands, plays host to a glittering array of the best of the best in world sailing. It is, quite frankly, a dream venue. 25 boats are laid on for the 50 sailors, 
half qualifying through the Star Sailors League and half invited for outstanding achievements in this varied sport. Not least, 16 Olympic medalists, a world match racing champion, and this man, Torben Grail, a round the world race winner and five-time Olympic medalist. Plus, Shimei Fantella, fresh from minting a 470 gold medal at the Rio Games and defending champions Eduardo Natucci and George Zabo, who scooped the biggest chunk of the 200,000 US dollar prize fund last year. It's looking like a windier forecast right now, so we're changing up our tune from last year and trying things we haven't tried before to go a little faster and breeze, but yeah, definitely our specialty is five to eight knots. It makes it more difficult, make it more crowded with the weather marks for sure, having you know five or six more boats on the race courses and make it more crowded everywhere but it's excellent to have the competition here and have the, just some of the best sailors here. It's so much fun, it's such clean racing always. It's just really looking forward to meeting all the new guys and they're really excited about trying out the Starboat so far. Jochen Schumann is Germany's most successful sailor with two America's Cup wins and three Olympic golds to his name. Last year we had a fantastic time. I think a beautiful regatta, beautiful venue and light wind favored a little bit the uh, unexperienced non-star sailors. So we did good in the qualifier, unfortunately uh, got kicked out very quickly out of the knockouts uh, on the first race. So now we are coming back and it would be beautiful if we could achieve something similar, getting into the finals would be just uh, achieving the best we can dream of. Robert Scheid came within a whisker of meddling in six consecutive games in Rio. He won here two years ago and now he's back. Well, I'm pretty excited to be back. Uh, after two years absent from the class, uh, involved in an Olympic campaign, to be able to come back here. I think this year the field is even stronger than the other years. I mean, it's an amazing lineup with the Olympic medalists and all the legends of the class. So I'm very excited. Robert came fourth in Rio, a tough result. So wouldn't it be amazing to have another crack at the latest laser gold, silver and bronze medalists? Well, they're all here in an SSL first. It's so nice to see these laser guys uh, enjoying the star racing. I think it's the best racing you can get these days. And, uh, I mean, uh, I'm happy to be able to race against them in another boat. Uh, I hope they, they enjoy a lot this week and uh, that more laser sailors come next year. The SSL format is unique in sailing. All 25 teams compete against each other in 11 races over four days. But then on day five, only 10 make the cut for the quarters, six for the semis, and just four for the final itself. Unlike the Olympics, whoever crosses the line first in that final race wins the event, whoever second is second, and so on. It makes the final fleet race finale understandable. And as Xavier Rohart says, we love this brutal format. We'll catch that drama later in the show, but for now, here's a summary of the qualifying rounds. On day one, race one saw a commanding display by Brazilian legend and five-time Olympic medalist, Robert Scheidt, along with crew Henry Boning. As the teams got used to the light wind conditions, it was quite a tight battle between Americans Mendelblatt and Fatih, the Italian team of Negri Lambertini, and the Brazilians, ultimately holding tight for the win. A win for Robert Scheidt and Henry Björning. As the breeze and waves built for race two, two Brazilian teams and the French drag raced up the course. But it's the French that round first. Polgar and Coy take an inside line. In fact, Xavier and Pierre Alexis have overtaken George and Bruno into first place, and that was slick sailing. The number one seeds took their first win of the event. But it was ultimately the Italians, with a third and a second, who took the day. We have just to think about the regatta. All these guys, of course, for the first two days, uh, they have to think also about the, the steering, about the trimming, and, and that's the little advantage that we have in the beginning. But I'm sure that next two days, uh, some new guys will be in the top three. I'm sure about that. Let's see if Diego has it right, and if the younger Olympians can rise to the top. Day two of the Star Sailors League Finals 
saw the Italians Diego Negri and Sergio Lambertini, who topped the scoreboard. It was a great race as well for the youngest sailor in the fleet, Argentinian Facundo Aleza, taking fifth. Fellow South Americans scored a second, while the Italians held on for the win. I'm really happy, Matt. It uh, would be not easy to stay on the same level, I think. Oh, there they go! The dying breeze meant changing conditions for the teams, adjusting their sailing styles and tactics for less wind. That is an incredible sight. 16 Olympic medalists all cramming in on one top mark. Staying mentally sharp was the name of the game throughout the day and three-time Olympic medalist, Slovenian Vasily Spogar, with his Hungarian crew, celebrated their victory in race five. A strong performance on the day with a race win, a second and a fifth, moved the former finals winners, Americans Mendelblatt and Fatih, onto the podium in third overall. The Italians dropped to second, while all top threes moved Brazilians Robert Scheidt and Henry Boning into the lead. Four tough races today. We managed to hang in there, be top three in all four races. Difficult conditions, difficult to start, but we were pretty happy, and especially because we won the last race. We're now halfway through the qualifiers. Two more days of racing still to go to determine who will go through to Saturday's finals. It was a different start for day three as Light Air greeted the veterans and invitees at the Star Sailors League Finals in Nassau. The teams were chomping at the bit. Halfway through the series now, it's a fight to put the least points on the board. The Argentinian in absolute trouble right on that mark. Everyone sailing around him. He's lost all his power, all his forward motion. With the race course closer to shore, making current a bigger factor, teams struggled all day to get around the top mark. Race one, it was newbie to star sailing, Rio Olympic gold medalist Shime Fantella and his crew Antonio Arapovic from Croatia, who were able to excel in the light breezes to take the race win. Great victory for Shime Fantella. Fine-tuned the boat today and uh, the speed was there. So I would say the key number one is the speed and then the clear air. Uh, overall, we are happy. All clear, all clear. All clear, fabulous stop. With Light Air, the great equalizer, the VIP invitee teams, the cream of the crop of sailing talent from different fleets around the world, were able to make plays amongst the fleet. But pulling out to a commanding lead was longtime star sailors, Germans Robert Staniak and Fritjof Klein. Stanjak and Clean sliding across the finish. They're going to be so happy with that. Well, we found an ideal line. It's a, it's a very, very light. Uh, the conditions we are seeing here, probably five knots. So we were clear off the fleet. And uh, yeah, from there on, we, we found a very good race. And we finished first, first time in the series. As the wind dropped to a near whisper, Mendelblatt and Fatih took the race win and the overall lead. Today was a bit of luck, um, just ending up in the right places and, and having good lanes. Um, we did get a couple really nice starts today, so that helped a lot. Um, the last one especially put us in good position, but uh, I'm just trying to sail clear air, clear water, and, and not really worry too much about what side's going to pay, and just focus on the boat speed, and it worked out today. It's all to play for tomorrow for the 10 spots to make it into the finals. The last day of qualifying at the Star Sailors League Finals was delayed by a short postponement, waiting for the win. I don't want to miss any race, so regardless of the result, I want to go and race no matter what. As the breeze filled, the fleet was off, focused on these final two qualifier races and making the all-important top ten spots. A shifty six to seven knots greeted the sailors out on Montague Bay with heat and humidity adding to the high pressure of the racing. Kiwi Olympic medalists Sam Meach and Craig Monk found form after a tough week, leading the race early. 
Concentration was needed as the holes on the race course wreaked havoc with the sailors. A nail-biting battle developed with the lightweight Croatians, Pantella and Arapovic, squeezing past Meech and Monk for the win. Super result by the Croatian Shime Fantella, 470 gold medalist, winning race number 10. It's George Zabo heading in, crunching oh, with that Sam is Meech. Too tight to tell. Race two, the fight was on, with points tight for seven teams trying to make the final three spots in the top 10. Last gasps of Breeze saw big lead changers through the fleet and tight packs at Mark Rounding. The Croatian Shime Fantella and Antonio Rapovic won again with fellow countrymen squeaking into the finals, winning the tiebreak for 10. And I said, let's go on the left side, there is nobody there. And then maybe this is uh, the, the last, last chance. And it was really like that. We, I think past 10 boats uh, in second up in the end. Thank God we are 10 overall. Losing that tie for 10th and a nail-biting finish, American Augie Diaz. Very disappointing not to be able to move forward, but at the same time I recognize that uh, the level here is quite high and I have to just be, be content with the fact that I didn't sail well in the last race and that's what cost me moving on. Atop the leaderboard now, giving them a bye straight to the finals, is Italian Diego Negri. So, very happy, but we know that it's not over. Uh, we already won the, the, um, the fleet races in Hamburg, uh, in the city event, and then uh, we finished fourth. So, for us it's been amazing, and uh, let's see tomorrow what happens. It's all to play for now for the biggest portions of the $200,000 prize purse in the knockout rounds coming up. It's crunch time at Nassau Yacht Club in the Bahamas. Ten teams out of 25 have made it through to the last day of the Star Sailors League final, and they face a game of survival through the quarters, semis, and final. The prize for winning the qualifying rounds is a jump to the final itself for Italians Negri and Lambertengi. Americans Mendelblatt and Fatih, winners here two years ago, jump to the semis. So the remaining eight out of the top ten are now in a fight in the quarterfinals. Well, there's the virtual eye view of Nassau on New Providence Island. Northeasterly breeze, we're off the eastern side of the island, a straightforward windward lured course. Seconds to go, left a picture, Dane, Bo Christensen with Stevie Milne getting squeezed out by Stepanovic and Sitchich from Croatia. Flag goes down, off they go for the quarterfinals. Straight windward lured, two laps. Looks like bow number one, Xavier Rohard and Pierre Alexis Ponso. After a great start there to lured of the Croatians, Stepanovic poles in clean air. The other Croatians, Fantella and Arapovic in clean air. Brazilians poking their nose out on the left-hand side as they look up the track. Two crews going right, Ho Christensen. And uh, here we are with Zabo and Atushi, defending champs, the American Italian winners last year, this time. I mean, in the past three years, these guys, the Poles, Kuznidovic and Jitski, have been on the podium twice. So ones to look out for as they thread their way upwind to the top mark. Kuznidovic and Jitski now showing a clean pair of heels. Background there, Negri and Labatengi just training up as the leaders go around this top mark. Dominic Jitski with Matt Kuznidovic, Zabo Natucci in second, Brazilians Schein and Björning in third, fourth, Frenchman Rohard and Ponso and Ho Christensen up into fifth. So sailing well upwind as we watch Henry Björning crewman with Robert Scheidt just preparing for that downwind rung. All but in trouble, the Germans, Johannes Polgar and Marcus Coy at the back of the fleet. Remember, five go through, three will get dropped into the semi-finals. 
on there are the two Croatian teams, two medalists from Rio, one in laser, Stepanovic with the silver medal, Vantella with the gold in the 470. A little battle amongst themselves there, Polder and Coy in trouble, Rohard and Ponzo, the deepest going downwind. And now Robert Shai jibing with Henry Björning, and these guys beginning to pick up speed on this downwind leg with Zabo Natucci in the background. Henry Björning there, crewman with Robert. Bo stringing that huge main sheet as they head down around the bottom gate. The Poles now in second spot where they've lost a place, but uh, that's fine by them. Top five going through, defending champ Zabo and Natucci. Around in third, closely followed by Rohart and Pierre Alexis Ponceau in fourth, winding in that huge main sheet as they steady up for the upwind beat on the second lap. Look like Polder and Coy beginning to work their way back into the game. Scheid and Björning now steady ahead of Kuznirovic and Jitski, Zabo and Atucci in the running. Let's see if the Germans are up into fourth or fifth around that top mark. Poles round in second. Nice going by Kuznirovic and Jitski. Well, Polgar and Coy now in fifth position ahead of Ho Christensen with the two Croatian teams at the back of the fleet. Two VIP guests, medalists from Rio. And there's the hunched view of gold. 470 medalist Shime Fantella. And the aerial view looking down beautiful waters in the Bahamas. Fantastic place to sail. And now Jonas Ho Christensen, the Danish sailor with Stephen Milne from Northern Ireland battling for survival in this competition. They are up against the Germans. Marcus Coy and Johannes Polgar hammering downwind towards the finish line. Polgar and Coy look like they have a slight edge over the Dane and Northern Irishman. As 120 meters ahead, clear in first. The Brazilians, Robert Scheidt with Henry Björning there. Henry congratulating Robert. Oh, what a bunch off for second, third and fourth. It's Zabo Natucci through ahead of the Frenchman, Rohard of Ponceau. And the Poles going through in fourth spot. Mateusz Kuznirovic coolly down there. And in fifth spot, the Germans, Johannes Polgar, Marcus Coy. Lovely job on that last leg. Stevie Milne banging the deck with Jonas Ho Christensen just missing the semi-final. It's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, we go out here today, today, we have eight boats on the starting line. I think there was five world champions in the star. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of... Uh, Olympic gold medalist from uh, from Rio and and uh, and then us. So we were, uh, you know, we we're in a tough crowd and uh, we did our very best. And uh, you know, big thanks to Michelle and everybody at SSL because I mean this is truly a phenomenal experience. Well, just making that top ten cut is a result for Ho Christensen with Stevie Milne, and same can be said for Stepanovic and Sitchich and Fantella and Adapovic, our VIP guests. Now our remaining characters will face Mendelblatt and Fatih, who won this event a couple of years back. Brian Fatih, the big crewman. Mark Mendelblatt, great star sailors. And here we go into the semis. Polgar and Koy Kuznidovic, Zitsky going for the committee boat end. At the far end there was uh, Mendelblatt and Fatih bow 17. In the middle, George Zabo, Eduardo Natucci. So an even start across that line. Oh, look at the Frenchman on the left-hand side getting squeezed out. That is a second-row start. They can't afford that. They are being dictated to now, having to work their way to the right-hand side of the racetrack. Well, let's see how that pans out towards the top mark. Big separation by the Frenchman as the Brazilians, Scheidt and Björning, tack, beautiful crew work underneath that boom. Oh, and look at this, towards the top mark, it is Rohard and Ponceau first into the top mark, just ahead of the poles, Kuznirovic and Zitsky, and Mendelblatt and Fatih threading their way into third position. Three boats go through to the final, three boats will be dropped at the end of this 
simple windward lured race. The Germans there in trouble, as are the Brazilians, Henry Björning and Robert Scheidt. Well, these guys seem to have an extra gear downwind. Let's see what they can do on this downwind leg as Zabo and the two chief defending champions bring up the rear. Well, they are well out of it right now. Polgar and Koi in trouble. But look at that lineup of three boats behind Rohard and Posso battling for survival in this competition. Rohard Ponceau leading the semi final. They are beginning to command this final day. Brilliant sailing by the Frenchman. Brazilians coming round. Oh, they managed to squeeze ahead of the Poles. Zabo and Natucci in fifth spot. They are battling for survival, as are Polgar and Koi. So only three go through very tight in second, third, and fourth. Polgar and Koi a lot to do. On the final downwind leg now, Poles. Knudovic and Ditsky neck and neck with Mendelblatt and Fatih. That is super close as they go down towards the finish. Mendelblatt and Fatih in a bit of trouble as well. Well, through the finish line, Xavier Rohart. Look at that lovely big smile there. Shaking the hand of Pierre Alexis Ponceau. Bravo, les Francais. Second through in the semis. It is the Brazilians, Scheidt and Björning. And here in third and fourth, the Americans, Mendelblatt and Fatih. Mendelblatt just stuffing the poles up into the committee boat. Then bang, they've hit. They will have to do a penalty turn. Wow, that was an aggressive move by the Americans. Mendelblatt, a great match racer. Whoa, he's fired up there. And uh, unfortunately for Kuznudovic and Zitsky, that is them out of the finals. You could see how much that means to Mateusz Kuznudovic. Well, so that's the Poles, the American Zabo, Natucci, and Polgar and Koi out. The top three going through to the finals. On to the final now, and they're joined by Negri and Lambertengi, the Italian Navy who won those qualifying rounds. And here they are for the first time today. They've been working their way up and down the beat, watching very closely. And we can see them in the middle of the pack. Four boats on the final line. Rohard and Ponceau, committee boat end with Mendelblatt and Fati. The Italians in the middle. And it's the Brazilians on the pin end. Well, can Robert Scheidt make this another win? He won this first event three years ago. Mendelblatt and Fati won two years ago. And here are the Frenchmen meaning business winners from the first ever Grand Slam in the city in Hamburg. Italians tacking over, working their way up when the sun is out in the Bahamas. Beautiful conditions off the eastern side of New Providence Island. The Italian... Sorry to bust into the replay of the SSL Nassau right finals because we are in race sequence. We're about three minutes to go to race number six of the Bacardi Cup. The decider, Kathleen Tock, in the studio with me. Now we're in excite mode. Yeah, this is it. We've got our eyes on Mark Mendelblatt, Xavier Rohart. Who's going to come out on top here? Let's try to find them on the screen. This very busy starting line, more than 70 boats. The breeze is filled in. I think the sailors are glad to stretch their legs and finally get this race off. So if you just joined us, these are the live shots from the race course from Biscayne Bay. We are about to get the race number six of the Bacardi Cup, the final and deciding race away, which is really, really good news. Out on the TV cat on our TV boat, Mr. Louie Habib has been in holding pattern all morning. Louie, let's join you. How do you think this is going to go, Louie? Well, I had a little chat with Luca Medina about half an hour ago, and he said that uh, they'd be racing in about half an hour, so he was spot on with that. Number two, he said, I'd want to start just left of the middle here, not all the way on the left. Uh, but uh, we can see at the moment lots and lots of boats up on the left-hand side on the pin end. Um, Luca was saying he'd like to be on the edge of that pack, 
so he's got a clear lane to tack out uh, once those boats hit the ley line. So we've got 30 seconds to the black flag down. Repeat, black flag down. So uh, you don't want to be over in the last race. You want to you want to get a good race in here. But uh, it looks like lucky left again. Digby, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Louis. Here are the live shots from the racetrack. With coming up to one minute to go to race number six. Four, three, two, one. Well, we're on board with Mendelblatt and Liljal. Magnus Liljal, the famous crewman, one of the most successful Bacardi Cup sailors of all time, sailing with Mark Mendelblatt. They've come together for this regatta. They are the leaderboard leaders as we go into the final race. They have two points over Rohart and Ponceau. You can see Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau favoring the committee the boat side, and there they are in our shot. What can a Frenchman do today? Can they haul in the American Swedish duo? That's the drone shot looking over the line. It's a black flag. We're coming up to 10 seconds, looking through the committee boat all the way down the line. Looks like somebody's over already. Let's tune in to the race committee. Two, one. And off they go for race number six of the Bacardi Cup. This is the final race. It is the decider of this great trophy. We're in the 90th year of the historic Bacardi Cup. Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau at the committee boat end, which they have favoured Mendelblatt and Lealjar towards the pin end. So all to play for between five teams here on the racetrack in Biscayne Bay. We've seen them there at that end of the line all week long. It was a little surprising to see them not close to Mark Mendelblatt to keep a gauge on him where he's going to be. They're going for their same strategy. They're going to go fast up this beat. They've got lots of room. There aren't many boats over on that side. They're going to be, have a clear lane, go fast, and play the shifts as they want because they're not in a big pack. Well, two boats heading back. Uh, we saw Chatagny and Pulfer head back towards the start line. And I'm just getting through my ear. General recall from the race officers, the PRO, Carl Schellbach, deciding too many boats over the start line. We will have a little replay on virtual eye of that start, get a feeling. But we could see through our camera and the uh, drone in the air that there was at least one boat over that line quite a long way. General recall, we'll have another go to restart race number six, but uh, let's have a little look in uh, virtual eye, minute to go. And we can see left of picture Rohard Ponceau just underneath the committee boat, the white boat, the big one, race committee. Just there, 30 seconds to go, Chatagny Pulfer in the middle there, McGowan and Simonet. I can't see if we can flag up where Mendelblatt is, I'm sure. Oh, we understand the tracker isn't uh, fired up right now. But uh, big bulge in the middle, just coming up. McGowan and Simonet clearly over. Look towards the pin end, and the boat's beginning to poke their nose over that mathematical start line. This is all through our tracker. No data for Mendelblatt at the moment, but uh, we'll see if we can fire that up. Uh, Vassella okay. and Trinter pretty punched on that line. Buckingham and, and Moss, Charlie's father, also very punched. We, you know, we saw this a couple days ago. It was the boats about two-thirds down the line that were punched, and they ended up getting called over. That was uh, Charlie Buckingham, Frida Clean, Jack Jennings. And they, they're down the line, and they think they're pretty much covered by the boats to windward, but the race committee saw them. So I'm sure we're going to see some numbers on the whiteboard, on the race committee, yeah. telling the sailors, you're out. Um, we're sorry. Thanks for coming to Bacardi, but you're going home. That's absolutely correct. Uh, as a black flag, any boat over the line is disqualified. So if they'd continued to race, those boats over the line would have been notified at the top of the course. But now the race committee can write down some numbers. They'll show them at the back of the committee boat, the numbers who were black flagged, and we'll see some boats 
going home in just a moment. We can join Louie on the racetrack. Uh, you are in uh, postponement mode. What's the latest, Louie? Uh, well, the latest, we have had the AP go up, but it's the uh, AP uh, over another flag. So I think they're, uh, that's suggesting it's a certain number of minutes um, that they're going to be uh, holding back for. So um, I don't think we're going to be off very soon, Digby. I'm trying to see if they're moving the top mark at all. I uh, can't see that, but yeah, I mean, it was a blanket over. There were so many boats over from my eye. Uh, you know, I don't think it was uh, a crowd at the uh, pin end. Uh, certainly, Rohart and Ponce were all on their own at the committee boat end. But, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to put that down to the competitors uh, once again. Uh, obviously, they've been waiting around for a while. They're eager to get going, and they were just a bit too eager there. Louis, um, sorry sorry yeah. to uh, interrupt, Louis. We're just looking through our live shot at the committee boat, and we are looking at AP over A, if I'm not mistaken. That means uh, racing pulled for the day. Well, that's a bit of a turn up, Kathleen. Why on earth have they done that, do you think? You know, I, I'm not sure. We still have time left here to get a race off. I don't know if they're seeing something on the radar uh, in terms of weather or they just don't believe in the stability of this breeze. It is a shame. I mean, we've gone out here early. We've waited around, and they just need to get one race off. They can get started one minute before the, the time limit. And uh, we have time here. You can see there's breeze. Um, so my guess is perhaps they're seeing something on the radar that we can't see here in the studio. What's the time? Louie, over to uh, Louie on the race course. Louie, what can you tell us? Uh, well, just astounded, Digby. I, I really can't tell you why they've uh, decided to can it. Um, I understood that uh, they had until 2 o'clock to get a race off. I'm guessing um, uh, that they decided they, uh, they couldn't get one in in the next hour. But um, I, 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 I'm sorry, Digby, I do not have an answer to that. Fair enough, Louie. Understood. Nor do we. Uh, we'll chat to Carl when he comes in. He'll have a very good reason. Um, they've done a marvellous job all week. And there we're seeing uh, the abandoned flag. Uh, AP over A, race abandoned, race number six. So that means the results stand. And it means that the winner of the 90th Bacardi Cup will be Mr. Mark Mendelblatt with Mr. Magnus Liljal. 13 points, two points ahead of Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis po Ponceau. And third on that podium will be Mr. George Zabo and Mr. Eduardo Natucci. So we've hung around all morning waiting for the race to get away, Kathleen. I can't tell you, uh, it's a little disappointing because it was all boiled down to this final race and we ramped it up like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and now, unfortunately, they pulled the pin. Yeah, I'm sure uh, Mark and Magnus are thrilled, but also I think they're looking to a good fight with True. Xavier Rohar. I mean, that's yep. what they love about the sport is is the win, and you don't want to win just by racing being cancelled on the last day. No. I mean, obviously, Mark and Magnus have had a great performance, very consistent throughout the week, but they're looking for, they want to win with just properly going out there and doing last battle. And a guy like George Zabo, I'm sure he had hopes today that he could make it uh, to the top of the podium. And knowing George's skill in the past, um, he won in our late Grand Slam in conditions just like this, he would have had a really good shot at it. And then Augie Diaz and Bruno Prada, reigning world champions, um, going in today in fifth after being third the previous day, but they had that black flag yesterday, not able to race that race. And I'm sure they're looking to go out there and finish with a good result. But here we go, Magnus Lidgetal, this is his sixth Bacardi Cup win. That is a tremendous, uh, just a tremendous benchmark in his career, tied there with Vince Brune um, with six wins, Mark Reynolds, seven wins, and Ding Schoonmaker with eight. So this is just a, an incredible feat for Magnus, and this is also Mark Mendelblatt's third win at the Bacardi Cup. Well, we will have Jenny chasing Mark out there on the water. If they can get a little interview, we'll um, jump on with Mark Mendelblatt and Magnus Liljal if we can uh, track them down. So um, I think uh, if we can show up the overall leaderboard, Chris, and uh, we'll just get a, a feeling for how this championship has panned out. Well, extraordinary, extraordinary. I'm we've a seen some. We've seen some upsets. <laughs> I thought in the sailing instructions they had until two. Um, uh, the guys from SSL are saying that it was until one. One was the cutoff, so that if they um, 
had a general recall on that one. No more time to run the race. But um, unfortunate that we are not running race number six of the Bacardi Cup for the guys at the top of the leaderboard to duke it out on the water. But congratulations to Mark Mendelblatt and Magnus Liljedal. I talked to Magnus this morning. He was fired up, looking forward to racing and uh, with Mark. And uh, well, there they go. They've ended up winners of the Bacardi Cup. Yeah, and uh, as we said, the Bacardi Cup is one of the greatest events in the star class after the star worlds. It's one of those events that you really have in your bucket list to win. And here we go, our winners today. And here is the standings as we see them. Mark Mendelblatt, Magnus Liljal, winners of the 90th Bacardi Cup, two points ahead of Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau, Zabo and Natucci. George Zabo, Eduardo Natucci, third on that podium. Okay, and straight in from the Star Sailors League, these are our new Star Sailors League rankings. And we have Xavier Rohar moving into position one. Diego Negri from Italy was the current uh, reigning SSL skipper, um, and, but George Zabo has also jumped Diego, who's moved down to three. So Xavier Rohart, the new number one in the SSL, George Zabo from the USA, number two, and Italian Diego Negri moves down to three. And here we go, and the crew is also another upset. We have Pierre Alexis Ponceau, the crew of Rohart, moves into number one position, I believe, for the first time. He's been ranked number two before. And Sergio Lambertangi from Italy, crewing for Hubert Merkelbach. They finished 12th in this event. Unfortunately, he's been bumped out of the first position, and but is ranked number two. And moving back up, Bruno Prada, the number one all-time crew in the SSL. Um, after a disappointing SSL final, he's moved from fifth place into third, and now I'm sure has the sights to bump Pierre Alexis Ponceau out of that first place position. But right now, Pierre Alexis Ponceau, the number one ranked SSL crew. Nice job. And back to the Bacardi Cup in fourth position, that uh, awful spot to finish any championship. Lars Grail, Sam Conchavis just off the podium. They've won this event twice. Uh, I think they'll be happy with their performance here. All single digit numbers there in their results, which is uh, pretty consistent and superb by that Brazilian duo. Uh, the first ever to win the card. And then uh, Ogi Diaz, Bruno Prada in fifth spot there. They were black flagged in race number five yesterday and they came in and we saw them gesticulating after the race with their coach and uh, they were convinced that they weren't over but uh, we replayed in virtual and it kind of looked like they were but you know that's one for the bar a little bit later after the prize giving. Charlie Buckingham, Austin Sperry fair play they were also black flagged in race number four but then they came out into race number five and scored a bullet and won fantastically uh, in that marvelous battle against McCausland and cheer and those guys in seventh 28 points they'll be happy with that they were black flagged on Tuesday on the second race uh, of the championship unfortunately but uh, consistent results are the way. And then in eighth, Melaby and Revkin. Now, Chris, our director, is saying that Jenny is on board with Mark Mendelblatt and Magnus Lilchal. They're steaming their way back towards the Coral Reef Yacht Club. Surprise winners, almost, of the Bacardi Cup. We were expecting another sixth race, but perhaps... Um, the guys on board and Jenny can uh, just explain a little bit about why they think that race didn't happen for a start. All right. Well, they can definitely clear up that answer for us, you guys. Um, they just told me they absolutely knew that. The well, explain to explain to us in the audience what just happened. Uh, we the breeze filled in. We had a um, unsuccessful black flag uh, start. It was a general recall and. Um, we're happy for that because it wasn't a very good start for us, but we were clear at least. Um, but uh, then the cutoff time came and they called it off for the day. So uh, that leaves us in first. And is this is this a happy feeling than not getting to race, Magnus? Are you disappointed in not getting to race or is it fine, we get to take home the Bacardi Cup? Well, I think that any time you can win, it doesn't really matter how you win, but the fact that we win, but it would have been nice to see a nice race, us prevailing, but I take this any day, of the year. 
Any day of the week. Yeah. All right, it is your third Bacardi Cup win, Mark. Huge congratulations on that. Very well done. How many events have you done, and what keeps you coming back? Uh, I've done Bacardi probably 10 times uh, at least. Um, you know, it's my hometown now. Uh, I think that, you know, the Bacardi brand and is, is a, a great brand, and their sponsorship of this event over the years has been you know, a real definer of the star class, you know, and I've been a big star sailor for since 2004. So uh, winning this regatta is, you know, very prestigious and something I've aimed for since I got into the star class. So uh, you know, it means a lot. It's great. Good. Um, it is very excellent for us as well to have Magnus, to have you back in the boat, a gold medalist star crew. I know you said that you're feeling your age at times this week. You retired after at least the first day of windy racing, but huge congratulations to take this win. Um, what does it mean to you, for, for you to be back sailing in the stars? Well, if one, I feel like I'm a lot fitter than when I started this this week, you know. It's been a good workout for me, and uh, it's it's like I, I learn a little bit every time I go out. It's, it may sound funny, but uh, you kind of keep your focus on sailing, and keep your talents alive and as you know I work with teaching others how to sail so it's it's good for me to get taught a lesson here and there as well so it works really well you know incidentally this was a race when there was no wind and we didn't get a race off yet this is the first time I'm bloodied on board here I have a little blood on my gear here so I'm not sure when that happened. <laughs> but that's all right. A little blood doesn't matter when you're taking home the trophy. Okay, huge congratulations to you guys, but let's talk a little bit about the competition this week. I mean, it is very close, ultimately. Only two points separating you from second place, just a couple points behind that in third. Um, can you talk to us about your competitors? Well, you know, Xavier comes away with a second, and, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, I had sent an email to Michelle earlier in the week, our, the founder of the Star Sailors League, and I told him that it was going to be Xavier's week, and I really did believe that, um, you know, it didn't keep keep us from doing our best and trying our best, but I did feel like it was going to be Xavier's week. He was sailing really well. He's one of those guys who, uh, you know, I have a, a, a big admiration for, uh, complete respect for, um, you know, come out on top of him in a regatta like this is, is, is a huge honor. Um, and, uh, you know, the other guys behind, uh, they sailed very well, too. You know, I think, you know, we all sailed really well, uh, very focused to sailing and clean sailing. Uh, for the most part, I got a little bit uh, aggravated at times, um, as I'm sure the others did in the tricky conditions. But uh, it was a very clean sailing and uh, a lot of respect in this fleet. Excellent. Well, you proved yourselves wrong. You took home the win. You were the local team. I'm sure there are a lot of people gunning for you, and they're going to be happy today. Thanks so much, you guys, and huge congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you all, Digby. Thanks, Jenny. Great to hear from on board the winners. Uh, Jenny's been doing a magic job out there. Um, so that is it. That is the 90th Bacardi Cup. Our default winners without race six, Mark Mendelblatt, Magnus Liljard, and worthy winners because really they sailed a consistent and brilliant championship ahead just of Xavier Rohart, Pierre Alexis Ponceau, with George Ebo, Eduardo Natucci on the podium in third. Now the next SSL production will be in December for the finals in Nassau. And it, it's going to be the fifth SSL final in Nassau in the Bahamas. And we have the top 10 SSL qualifiers uh, going to the Bahamas. And then there's VIP guests from the world of match racing, the Olympic classes racing, around the world racing, and so on. Some of the biggest names in sailing, like Robert Scheid and all those sort of guys. Big medalists, big names. So that's one to really look forward to, and I look forward to that. Um, before we go, I'm going to say a very quick thanks to our team, our crew here, who've worked super, super hard and put some good stuff together and I'm going to run through them as fast as I can. Well done, Jason. Uh, well done to Pedro, our boat owner, Danny and Matty, our drivers out there, Simon and Ginge from Liveline, who without whom nothing would happen. They do all the links. Adam and Seb, our cameraman from AMI, Simon from AMI, Steve for our lovely edits. Thanks, Steve. Good -o. Andy from Proactive for doing all the audio mixing, sorting out all our studio here so beautifully. You can't actually see the gaffer tape above all this, but uh, <laughs> it's a work of art, I can tell you. Andy Warhol would be proud. Uh, Paul and Ben from ARL Virtual Eye, who are doing that fantastic uh, stuff. Uh, Will, Seb, and Raquelli from the SSL. Thanks, guys, for keeping us straight. 
our fellow uh, yakkers, Lue on the water, Jenny just there, and the lovely Kathleen Tock here. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Always a pleasure. I loved your history earlier on today. Good film. Chris, our director, well done, Chris, for keeping us straight and uh, pressing all the buttons pretty much uh, in the right order. Uh, <laughs> our hosts, the US Sailing Center, Pat here, the Coral Reef Yacht Club, Carl Shellbach, and his team, his race officer team, they've been pretty marvelous. They were up against it today, and none of us are going to hold anything against you, Carl, because we love you. Uh, Michelle in Switzerland for getting us here and coming up uh, in part with this whole concept and for uh, coming up with the whole SSL with Xavier and the sailors and coming up with construction, uh, constructive feedback for us. Good on you, Michelle. And all the sailors for getting stuck in. They've all been involved. They've all enjoyed coming into the studio and having a look, seeing what we're doing. The Bacardi Cup is not part, not an SSL event, but we've kind of rolled in. And it seems to have worked rather nicely. And the sailors have loved it. And they've enjoyed watching uh, the playbacks on YouTube. In fact, some of the guys were saying they had a big old party last night. Uh, I think it was Vasella, <laughs> Peter Vasella, Phil Trenter had a party at their house last night, replayed the whole day from yesterday and got stuck in a little bit. Good on them and good for you. Thank you to all the sailors. And uh, to you, the uh, viewers, for sticking through watching and enjoying this uh, show. Next one is in the Bahamas. But for now, from Kathleen and myself and the crew here in the Coral Reef Yacht Club, the US Sailing Center, Biscayne Bay in Miami. Adios.